If you're doing magic, you're asking to be changed. You may not think that because of how most people write about magic, that it's all happening externally. But if you're doing magic, you are asking the powers and the fields, however you want to view it, to make you different. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to another edition of the Glitch Bottle Podcast, where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. Today, we are elated to welcome back to the podcast author, talismanic jeweler, and dirt sorcerer, Mr. Aiden Wachter. Now, Aiden, in addition to many other areas of expertise, is the author of Six Ways, Approaches and Entries for Practical Magic, which we discussed in episodes 60 and 61 of the podcast. So if you haven't checked those out yet, I would definitely recommend it. In this episode, Aiden is sharing about his latest tome and sister book to Six Ways entitled Weaving Fate. Hyper sigils, changing the past, and telling true lies. Now, whereas Six Ways does an excellent job of giving a broad survey and detailing of various practices, rituals, and visualization techniques to help esotericists on our path, Weaving Fate, as Aiden says, is very, very different. The focus this time, Aiden says, is on a few interlocked tools or approaches that are some of the very best that he knows for creating major changes, all looked at in much greater depth and on a personal level I have to say I found Weaving Fate is such a good and healthy and needed gut check of a book and it accomplishes this on a few different levels first the book is a reminder of how many esotericists magicians and practitioners tend to become obsessed about the fruits quote-unquote of magic like a better job security attracting a partner material results whatever the case may be but Aiden draws our attention to the needed root work that needs to happen to heal past traumas and to get comfortable in moving through the corridors of our own minds, which so many of us, I know myself, often neglect. And when we neglect this, this can truncate any magical results of progress that we were hoping to make in the first place. So secondly, Aiden's work gives us incredible teachings from journaling to building our own palaces through visualization, which yes, pun fully intended, weave together to give us strong foundations at the very roots of our consciousness. Third, Aiden's tome is a true reminder of the incredible work that lies before us in individual idiosyncratic ways in order to heal ourselves and to develop our own systems with the three specific tools that he shares about in the book. Fourth, and with a huge thank you, is your wonderful Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions for Aiden because they were, as usual, exquisite and they led to some really great discussions. Also, Glitch Bottle patrons can hear Aiden sharing about the Enochian Scabies, which is a story in and of itself on Patreon. And fifth and finally, Aiden is simply a badass and an equally generous and wonderful person. And Aiden also has a podcast as well, which we'll make sure to link to. And now, returning to help us uncork the uncommon, I give you Mr. Aiden Wachter. Aiden Wachter, thank you so much just for taking the time and coming back on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. That was like an overwhelming intro. So thank you so much for having me. I, I really uh, loved our last chat and uh, still get kind of constant feedback from people about it, which is great. And I'm totally stoked to do it again. And thank you. Thank you for reading the book and thinking about it and, and having me. The honor is, is certainly mine, Aiden, and, and I know I speak for the listeners and, and the patrons that, I mean, this book was just incredible. It, it's not often that reading a book and engaging in the visualization and the journeying practices that, that I cry, that I feel ripped open and yet healing at the same time, especially after writing Six Ways, when it comes to the genesis of Weaving Fate, you have a few different quotes and kind of introductions that set the tone for the book. One of the quotes is by Jan Fries. Can you kind of share this, this quote with us and kind of the importance of, of this quote? Yeah. Um, I was actually done writing the book 
and I knew that there was a piece that, that I couldn't figure out where it had come from <laughs> that kind of led to the kind of overarching kind of metaphor of the book, which is weaving fate. And I realized that it was probably freeze. And so I went and, and checked and indeed it's from his book sideways. I'm just going to throw this out there because people will bitch otherwise sideways is not a good book about Norse Seder, <laughs> but it's a really fucking great book. So if you just accept that he is not talking about that thing in the way that most kind of neo-pagan Norse magicians would find reasonable, it, I agree. It's, it's not that, but it's an incredibly useful book, but freeze writes this in sideways. He says, in Nordic philosophy, fate was considered a weaving that was influenced by all living beings. People could influence fate and shape it to some extent, which is a long way from the fatalism which requires people to sit still and suffer. You mentioned that the weavers are the patrons of weaving fate. And to Freeze's quote, you also open the book with and open the first chapter with the weaver's rune. Can you recite this for us and, and, and then kind of talk to us how the two quotes weave together, really? Sure. So if anybody's seen the book, there's a what, what appears to be a bind rune on the cover. And it's actually not a bind rune. It is actually a sigil. The way that I do sigils and do play with the shapes of them it makes sense in a particular light the mind room does as well, but it really is a sigil and it is built from the weaver's rune that I'll read. This is the statement of intent for that piece essentially. And it says my fate, I weave with weaver's hands Three sisters shape my destiny, my fingers deep within their web of all that was that is shall be. And so for those who, are familiar with Norse philosophy uh, as it comes down to us today. I'm not a big believer in reconstruction of these things because I think we can never come close to mimicking the actual experience of someone from previous times. The weavers in are the Norns, which in kind of you know Greek and Roman would be the parka or the fates. And the difference in Norse philosophy from many others is they really believed that fate was unfolding as far as I can tell. This is my interpretation. Again, I don't believe that reconstruction is possible. So I'm not saying it was, this is how I read it and how I understand it. And so the weavers are the Erda, which is best thought of as that which was, that which has come to pass already. Vrthendi and Vrthendi is that which is kind of occurring or unfolding right now. And Skold, which I kind of attribute my understanding of that to Lonnie Scott, it's usually stated that what that means is it's what will come to pass, right? And that sounds like the traditional understanding of fate, right? It's destined, it's happening. And what Lonnie suggested to me and makes way more sense was that Scold should be thought of as what should come to pass based upon how things are right now and how they were in the past. But kind of the work of magic, which I, in this case, obviously I'm speaking of as weaving fate, is to influence that trajectory. So it's not fixed. Like Freeze said, it's not fatalistic. The weavers are involved everything is involved, which means you are involved, which means you can get more involved. And so this is the focus of the book. There's an incredible malleability of time too, Aiden. I'm, I'm wondering if you can, if you can share about that because of course, all of us, you know, have at least a concretized, very false dichotomy view of there's the past and there's the present and there's the future. And yet this kind of blends them all together uh, using a very narrow range of tools. Was that was that intentional to kind of bypass the kind of mammalian circuitry that, that tends to put things into neat little boxes? I think I'm not going to throw that on mammals. I'm going to throw that on civilization. <laughs> I'm going to throw that on the rise of agriculture and domesticated you know, livestock animals. But I do believe that previously, like right now we have a, we're living in a kind of, unless we're talking kind of quantum math and physics and stuff. But for most of us, we experience time in a very linear, linear function, right? It's step after step after step. But I think if we kind of look at 
again, kind of concepts of the weavers in, in, in the, the Norse traditions in some descriptions of Seder uh, that I've read, they're really playing with the idea that time itself, right? The weavers can be thought of as a description of time, right? Are malleable at all points. And so it's not that you can undo necessarily, though I'm not against the idea, something that occurred in the past, but you can change its impacts in the present, which then changes its impacts in the future, which then changes your trajectory or changes your fate. And that is really, again, it's like, I'm just going to keep repeating this. That's the, what the book is looking at. You specifically say in the book that to do this, to accomplish this, you employ three specific tools and, and we'll definitely get into each of the different tools and, and practices later on. But can you share just kind of specifically why did you employ this more specific focus of the black book, the corridor and the fever stone? So this book was started. The black book portion was pretty well fleshed out. And I had another potential chunk of stuff that I could have added. And I really, uh, as things were kind of degrading starting about, Two years ago, I'm going to say for me, meaning that the kind of worldwide situation seems like it was degrading. I began thinking more on how to kind of help folks out a bit, right? And one of the things that I did was shifted from making jewelry and I taught a course for about 120 people or something. And in that course, while I was in it, kind of the rise of the pandemic and the kind of rapid decline of things socially around the world, not due to that, but because kind of in a, it's a, I hate to say symbiotic about something that is that unpleasant for everyone, but I look at kind of the growing world situation and then the pandemic on top of it is kind of a bad symbiosis for most people. Right. And so I began shifting the class while we were, while I was teaching it in the direction of really the last portion of the book And so with the class done, the pandemic kicking up, I was out getting my father into hospice because he was on his way out as well and realized that I should finish the book and really try and create something that was specifically would be the most beneficial version of the book for right now or time is like right now because I don't think we're done with this regardless of what happens the next year or two. I think we're on a trajectory that's a little bit ugly for a while. And so that was really the focus there is like, what's the best tool set that does the work that needs to be done for most of the people that I know, right? I kind of write for the people that I know. So the folks that are in my sphere in one way or the other. And there are three pieces that I have done kind of crazy amounts of work on myself uh, as well. The black book portion is the oldest. I've been doing that since the 90s. The Corridor kind of appeared maybe seven or eight years ago, and then The Fever Stone about four or five, I guess, something like that. And so they were just a really logical collection of tools that I knew worked in a very particular way together. And that was important to me as well. I didn't want to dump something like Six Ways that was like, here's a bunch of stuff that's useful that you could spend some time working on. I wanted to be like, no, this is the toolbox that you can do a lot with if you're willing to kind of throw yourself into it and really be willing to do the work and kind of get comfortable with the uncomfortable concepts so that you can kind of see how it all works together because it really does. You also mentioned, Aiden, that these tools are designed to tackle what you call the roots. And you say that there's the roots and then there's the fruits. And in the magical esoteric context, you you touch on this in the book that so many people are focused on the fruits of a thing. Like, how can I get a better car, a better job, attract a partner, uh, some kind of materialistic benefit? But you really stress that it is root work and it is deep foundational work that is needed, especially in this light of a pandemic all kinds of change going on. What are the roots and and why are the roots so important? You know, it's interesting because for me, um, when I write books, and this happened with Six Ways too, but it happened very much more so with this, is it's like I kind of come up with like a working idea. And then at some point the metaphor hits 
that makes sense of what I'm trying to do. And this is that, and so this was not really, you know, some people might be confused that this is not a Northern magic book, considering how much Northern <laughs> mythology kind of concepts are in it, right? The Norns and the tree and all of this stuff. So again, if we look at the kind of Norse tale of the weavers, the weavers live down at the roots of the tree at Earth as well. And it's that water that is feeding the world tree, right? And so we use the metaphor of that tree as also being a metaphor for us, right? And I mentioned this in the book. This is a relevant piece in, I think it's from the Havamal where Odin talks about finding the runes and he says that he hung himself on the tree, myself and offering to myself, right? And I always have read this, that he is aware that he is the tree, right? And this is an important concept for me as a, as a magician to go, okay, I'm not just the things that I can see right now. There's this deep history that is both occurring on a physical level, it's occurring on an emotional level, it's occurring on a psychological level, it's occurring on a psychic level. For those that are kind of comfortable with the woo things, you could say that these things are happening on different energetic or astral body levels. All of those things that go to grow us into the person that we are, are the roots of the tree. And so if we are too messed up on those really deep levels, and this is not about getting right before you can begin something, it's all interlaced. Those effects are like the water or the nutrients that feeds the tree that is us. And so we keep going after specific fruits, which as you say, are kind of specific outcomes going, I need my life to be more like this. And that is, I need more money. I need a different line of work. I need a partner that understands me better, but the fruit doesn't tend to not reflect the tree. So if we really want to have those outcomes come in a like lasting functional healthy pathway. We really have to do that inner work to kind of heal the tree that is us and to make sure that what we're feeding is not devoid of kind of anything bad. Cause I don't think we get to do that in this world, but that we're taking care of the business so that all of our outcomes are reflecting that we're not having to necessarily say, I need this, this, and this, so I can be happy we can kind of set our life up in a way if we address things on these levels so that we are happy and we are well. And the things that come from that are suitable to who we are in that state. This kind of discovery that you made of the roots and of the interlacing, as you say, I think is wonderfully reflected in the book about your early experiences. And to that point, Aiden, we do have a listener question from Jessica Irene, who's asking, in the introductory sections of Leaving Fate, there is mention of these experiences that Aiden later begins to understand as initiations. Could you elaborate, Aiden, on what is your concept of initiatory experience and the purpose that these experiences serve? And Jessica's asking, must they always be states of fear or loss of agency? So initiation is, you know, if we're looking at the word, it's to initiate is to begin, right? And so this is the way that I think about initiation. Um, we often do to kind of, and I'm not saying this is actually in the systems, but it's often a misunderstanding of Western magical systems. People often think that the initiation is the end of something and it's not, it's the beginning of something. And so to me, what they are is those are the places where the road diverges and we know it, where something intensifies and we know it where there's an actual solid shift and we know it. And we may not know it at the time. It might take us a while, but at some point we were able to go, okay, my life changed at that point. That point is the beginning of my life since that moment. Right. And we could get all hyper abstract and say, well, this is happening every second of every day, but we're talking on a different level here. To me, what they do is they really are the thing that like literally allows us, and we'll talk more on this, it allows us to change our path. We may not know that we did it, but we were in 
we were on a track, we were on a path, we came to a place and we made a decision. That's the core concept to me of initiation. And then we're on a different path. For me, most of mine were really intense and really kind of terrifying. I know a lot of people that that has not been their experience, but I do know a lot that it was. I've thought about that extensively. And I know that I was looking for something different. I was looking for a different way of being in the world than what was presented to me when these things started happening. And the sense that I got is there is a kind of experience that is so outside of our norm that like the animal body's response is often fear. It's not necessarily the correct response. Not that I know that there is, but it's simply, it's kind of like a, I've had experiences, and I think we talked about this last time, I've had kind of also initiatory experiences that were intensely sexual. And when talking to the you know, spirits involved, they basically said, that's the only way you know how to read this because it's so intense, but it's not unpleasant. So you are in your animal experience, body experiencing a sexual response. That's not what we're doing. It doesn't bother us. You know, you just don't know how to do this yet. And so I think that that's often what a lot of the kind of fear or terror aspects are. And even the kind of loss of agency aspect, I've rarely had a sense of true loss of agency in one of these things, though that is again, somewhat common. But I often wonder if that is really, again, if we kind of view ourselves as spirits riding this animal body, the animal body doesn't know how to move. So it thinks it can't. And I don't know if that answers her question, but that's the, that's what comes to mind. To follow up on that too, Aiden, when working and weaving fate with these very specific, very focused set of tools, these tools are incredibly powerful. The ones that, that you share. And if people are delving into the consciousness, the deep, deep, deep layers of consciousness of their own minds. And if they are reaching in the past and looking to the future and kind of weaving these things together, if they do experience these kind of sudden rapid shifts in consciousness, this kind of just sudden pivoting where, as you said, the animal body might not know how to react. How do you recommend people handle that, navigate through that? Of course, every situation is different, but just in general. But what works for me and has worked for me for a long time is when these things happen, we have a tendency, I have a tendency, I'm not going to speak for anybody else. I have a tendency to hit a particular intensity of experience. And as a magician and as somebody who's kind of hunting these things, sometimes I want more, right? And so I tend to want to dive in deep right away. And that's not always the best solution. And so for me, it's about being patient is the first piece and going, okay, I had that thing. It was really wild. I don't know what it is. So I have to be patient and go, it's okay that I don't know what it is. I don't have to attempt to figure out what just happened. This is not easy for most people. It was not easy for me initially to go, okay, something really different has happened. I feel really different. Things seem really different. Let's just sit with that and see. Because sometimes these things aren't, they're important in the moment, but they don't persist. I'm a little bit weird again, because I'm not interested in kind of what most people think of as religious experience. Meaning that if I have an encounter with a spirit and I get some information from that spirit, I'm not going to necessarily put that spirit on a pedestal. Um, even if that is something that I am perceiving as a particular God, Woden or Hecate or something. This is a, a being that is interacting with me as I interact with other beings. Events occur likewise that because of their intensity, we may weight them much heavier than uh, others. Uh, you know, for example, I had a, an experience in the 90s where I was robbed at gunpoint. 
I could have allowed that process by not really looking at it on the front and also by then assuming that the kinds of people who robbed me as far as what they looked like physically then meant that they were a threat. Everyone like that was a threat to me or taking on, okay, I am now terrified of being robbed again, right? All these things we do very regularly for whatever reason, by the time that happened, that just happened. I was more aware when I was walking after that for a little while, and then I kind of adjusted to a new normal, right? So understanding that we are, that's that all of that stuff is very helpful. The other thing that is a big thing I talk about in I think both books, but more in Weaving Fate, is when we're seeking transformative experience, we get changed in ways that we do not know what that is gonna be like on the other side. To me, that's kind of the game of the sorcerer. That is perhaps the division between the sorcerer or the witch or whatever you wanna call it, and someone who is approaching life in a more normal fashion. I will say normal. I don't think we're abnormal, but most people do. We can just go with that. And so if we know going into the game that we're asking to be changed and to change our reality or reality itself, however you want to view that, some of that is going to be really odd and some of it's going to be uncomfortable and some of it's going to suck. And I think we just have to walk knowing that. It's no reason not to walk. Kind of like, you know, I was going to go visit a friend who and was walking up his street when I got robbed. This didn't stop me from walking his street. It did cause me to kind of notice if people were hiding behind cars more than I had before. It's just an awareness thing, I think, and, and, and accepting that you are, if you're doing magic, you're asking to be changed. You may not think that because of how most people write about magic, that it's all happening externally. But if you're doing magic, you are asking the powers and the fields, however you want to view it, to make you different, uh, at least in my opinion. And that's what you kind of have to bring to that. Your book did that to me where it, we were chatting before the podcast. This is just a, a boxing analogy, but it's like body shots in boxing where it, it pays off interest later where you don't notice something. And then all of a sudden, you know, hours later after reading your book, new insights, new observations, new connections to previous points that you were making started to kind of marinate and cause new you know, neural pathways, so to speak. And as I was going through your book, you have this great point that context is king. Can you just kind of share with listeners, Aiden, about what do you mean by context specifically? And especially in a day and age where, you know, a lot of books out there might present things in a cookie cutter fashion. If you do this, you know, during a waxing moon, you'll achieve this. Why is it so important that there should be context as people approach the book? <laughs> so a great number of years ago now, though it doesn't seem like it, as the internet was exploding and people were trying to figure out how you made money there, there was this thing that the bloggers were always talking about, which was content is king, right? That if we're going to have all this stuff online, and that term always kind of irritated me. And uh, at some point I began talking about context being king. And so what I mean when I say that context is king is that each of us is individually in an incredibly singular moment. And so context can be thought of as kind of the snapshot of a being in a moment, including all the various causes and conditions that led to them being where they are, who they are, doing what they are doing, not doing what they are not doing, thinking or not thinking, you know, what, what is going on. All of their relations, their class status, their social position within whether a, so, you know, a, a wider society or even within like a peer group or a relationship, their self-opinion, their health. I really don't know that I believe in neurotypicalness anymore, but how neurally divergent they are and what that does for them. And so a sense, context is like the bodies, the soul complex, the mind, the ecosystem they're a part of, both kind of in a normal sense and as a spirit ecosystem, and all of the other factors that define that being in the moment. And that whatever you choose to do is a reflection of that. It's not that it has to reflect that. 
It's that it has no choice but to reflect that. So to me, kind of cookie cutter approaches for most things don't make sense. Then you're just kind of playing into selection bias. Uh, so in context, it's king is really going, okay, who and where am I right now? Not who do I think I am? That's the second piece of that. Who actually am I? That's what I got at the moment on that, but I'm happy to elaborate if that's, if it needs it. One of the themes in your book is if you take that unique individual and that unique context, there's also a malleability of where they are now versus say after they read the book and once they start applying things, and then once they start, as we'll get into the very mysterious X later on, as you start applying these tools and thinking that you're on a plateau, that's just simply shattered and then reformed and shattered again. And, and this goes to your definition about how magic in, in one of your definitions is quote, an art of change. And you say that weaving fate is best for those who want to mix it up. Given the context of context, that sounds strange, but <laughs> can, you, can you talk about the importance of, even if someone is so gung-ho and they're ready to go, that there is going to be this kind of ever-present, this kind of ambient malleability in working with these tools and in growing? Well, first off, X thinks it's really hot that you said that she was mysterious and she asked that I say that. Oh, X thanks you. Okay. Well, you are welcome, X. <laughs> <laughs> um, this really ties into that thing we were ta I was talking about in, in reference to that question, right? Which is, in my mind, practical magic. In practical magic is, in some places, would be called operative magic or low magic or that is always looking for a change. And because things are always changing, even if you're looking for things to stay the same, <laughs> it's change, right? You're asking it not to change. This is that metaphor that I have of like in the book that if you are not going to dig into the, to the machinery of your life, I don't understand why people do magic. And it's not simply because that's the only thing you can do. It's just that it's going to be a side effect that could be a huge benefit if you kind of addressed it head on because you can do more again with the roots of the tree. You can get more out of the car by opening the hood <laughs> mucking around in there and you can break it sometimes. Right. Uh, but you can fix it, which again, sinks into that kind of comfort with fear and change and all of those things. So if we kind of view that, what we're trying to do is we're trying to shift situations, players, desires, objectives, thoughts, or physical aspects of reality. And this is exactly the thing I was saying before. We have to be open to the reality that change requires change. You don't get to have things be exactly as they are today and have a different outcome tomorrow. So you won't be who you were after working. And so you have to always adjust. And I think this is, it kind of, again, goes in, you know, it's like I always go into the physical training metaphor. And one of the things that one of the guys that, I first learned how to lift kind of more intelligently from said, he said, every time you come back into the gym, you know, one or two days after the last time you did, and you go into the squat rack to do squats, you need to be aware that you are different because of the sessions that happened before. And that this is the goal, but it requires you to pay a lot of attention because eventually that, cue that you used because of a weak point or a bad postural habit won't be the cue that will help you anymore because that will no longer be an issue, but there'll be a new one. And so you have to be really aware. And so I think that that awareness of being flexible and malleable is, is crucial. And as I think we'll get into later, it's also kind of the thing that is I believe has been kind of machined into a fearful thing for people, not just in magic, but on a very wide scale. You mentioned that these are specific practices to help you delve into your consciousness, but it's not about erasing all of the past experiences where you are free from the dharmic chain. In fact, you, you share in the book about reading an old school Buddhist text about breaking the chain of cause and effect and 
I'm probably totally misquoting you, but I, I remember from the book, I think, where you're like, I'm probably breaking some kind of, you know, dharmic rule here. But you, you, you mentioned in the book that the point of these tools is it does not free us from reality, nor does it free us from the vast chains of cause and effect. So can you talk about these tools and this wisdom and how people can use that in the art of creating change? So I'm kind of a, a weird bird, though I've found a lot more of us as, as I've gone in in that I have a deep respect for specifically Theravada Buddhism, which is kind of old school Buddhism. It's based on the actual teachings of the Buddha, not really geared towards interpretation of those or later things that kind of happen in places like um, Mahayana Buddhism. And so this is like Pali Canon stuff, your basics, really your basic Buddhism. But I'm a sorcerer, and so I'm not actually looking for the same aims as a monk would. But I find that the there's an inherent logic to the toolkit and in my experience an accuracy to the kind of buddhist model of psychology and cause and effect in many ways and so what we're talking about there is that and i know i'm going to hit this later but one of the basic things that the buddha talked about is he said you know everything arises from things that happened before right this is cause and effect and this is the thing that the American in particular and the new age in particular understanding of karma, I think is drastically, drastically wrong because karma is explicitly discussed in many places by very you know, kind of high level Buddhist practitioners that are not from the West as being kind of the laws of cause and effect. And so I think of it like physics, right? Certain events occur because certain other events occur certain phenomena arise because certain phenomena did arise. If you remove a cause, there is no effect from that cause, right? A lot of people are trying to, I think, in kind of more mystical traditions or religious traditions that are kind of based on these Eastern ideas, are trying to separate themselves from, they're trying to achieve a state where they're not generating karma, right? They're not generating these cause and effect things that are keep us bound to this plane. I like this plane. I think it's pretty cool. I'm not in a rush to get off of it and I'm happy to come back. And so what we're talking about there is, is if we use that idea that everything is coming about because of things that happened before, we can then go, and I think, yeah, I talk about this in the book. What would have had to have happened before for me to be in a different place? And is there a magical approach to creating an as if cause for that to be true? And this is kind of what I think goes on in ritual magic or practical magic. Is that related Aiden to another really important theme you talk about in the book, which is rewilding. I love this. You, you, you say that magic is a kind of rewilding and we need that on an individual level, on kind of a global level. Can, can you elaborate on this concept of rewilding? What does that mean? Yeah. So I have, you know, a bunch of different feeder kind of things that feed into my work. And that is, you know, just for things that show up in the book, everything from, you know, Judas Priest lyrics to a variety of kind of anarchist sources. And this is not to say that I'm specifically an anarchist, but I'm always happy to take what is useful from anywhere. Rewilding is a really interesting concept, and it's an interesting concept to me in part because it exists in two different fields. And in one is the deep ecology use of it, which I believe came first, but I don't know. And in deep ecology, rewilding is where we go. We've broken an ecosystem and are there things that we can do to heal that ecosystem? The most common version of this is if anybody, most people will be at least somewhat aware, I think, of this idea. And if not, it's really interesting to look at that. If you want to have like healthy populations of rodents and ruminants and things like that in a forest ecosystem, you need large predators. You need wolves. You need big cats because they're all inter interlaced, right? And this is a very basic explanation of this for kind of deep ecology rewilding. 
So the idea there is if we want to improve the health of a forest, one of the ways we can do that is by reintroducing these large predators. Another thing we could do that is similar is I think one of the reasons that the United States is so kind of energetically fucked up, and this is probably true other places, but I don't have a lot of experience with other countries, is how much fencing and how much blockages there are to animal migration. So the system can't work because the pieces of the system can't move freely, right? So in deep ecology, rewilding is kind of dealing with this idea of how do we reintroduce the aspects of the ecosystem that we have in some way broken due to our, what we've done as a civilization to allow it to become more like it was without us there, right? To become wilder again. And then in anarcho-primitivism, this is also a related idea, but it's more about how do we as people learn to live in a way that isn't as damaging and that where our existence isn't throwing up all of these blockages to the world operating as it has for, you know, an immense period of time. And so it's kind of accepting in both cases, I think, that we're looking at a realization that natural systems are broken and that there's not really probably an industrial technological fix for it. So it also questions how what we do now benefits, and this is something that I bring, I don't know that this is present, but it's, it's a kind of logical conclusion that it brings to me is, how are we functioning within this whole system? Are we okay with these changes that we've wrought on a very deep level? Not our like, like consciously, well, I think humans are rad, so I'm okay with it. Not that. How are we on a kind of soul, psyche, spiritual level with that? So pull that over to magic. The idea that I'm talking about here is that our internal landscape, our mindscape, our fantasy scape, our imagination is massively colonized by the cultures that we live in and shaped by that in a way that I do not believe is beneficial from a magical perspective. I don't believe it's beneficial for the animal perspective. The animal that we are, I think, is being crushed by the way that we are doing the world. And if we want to be freer, healthier beings, we have to, I believe, kind of address the fact that the way we look at things, even it's, not, it's beyond just do we look at these things as being issues, but are the way that we look at them really ruled by the kind of um, information stream we were raised in and exist in? And so how much room do we have to experience the world in an unmediated fashion as we are now, right? Remembering that things like YouTube and Google and Apple and the like are not actually the important parts of being alive. And the things that matter to corporations on that scale, I'm not picking them out in specific necessarily, are not actually important to being well, that these things may be entirely detrimental and that they are the primary producers of the information that we intake, that they are the controllers of what we see as possible. So like, I know weird amounts about things that I have no interest in, just kind of by osmosis from being online, right? And this is going on continuously. So rewilding the mind, rewilding our magic is can we begin to stop looking at external reasons for what we're doing? I uh, play a game with this in my books because I know I'm probably thinking a little bit of, on a different track from people, but I tend to use really kind of base level examples of, of intentions or desires or targets because I believe that the work itself will move somebody beyond that. I don't have to try and tell somebody you should be focused on something different than the fact that you want a car. I think that if you keep playing for long enough, you're going to find your version of this and go, okay, there's an aspect of myself that is not intrinsic. It is not native to this being that I am. It's an overlay. It's programmed. And I'm maybe not interested in doing that anymore. 
to your point about rewilding and uncrushing ourselves, you know, reinstituting the semblance of what it means to be human, how important when we're doing this and attempting to do this and working with the tools, how important is it to have a sense of serious play? This is something that you talk about in the book, and it's something that I definitely got a sense of in Six Ways and in our previous chats, which is this is really, really, really important work. But at the same time, we shouldn't let the gravity or the seriousness of this end up in a state of petrification or constipation in a way. So how important is this concept of serious play? What does that mean in terms, especially in in terms of working with these tools? (laughs) So my definition of serious play is approaching your work with kind of earnestness, as I talked about in six ways, but not having a stick up your ass about what you're doing. Um, (laughs) And so it's, realizing again, it's like you are asking for <laughs> to me, and this is, I'm, I'm going to, I can only ever speak for myself, but to me, magic is this amazing art form because you are actually going, I'm going to change me and my world. And to me, that is an incredibly heavy thing, but it's also an incredibly playful stance. It's saying, I don't like the color of my house, so I'm going to paint it. I don't see that the things that I'm told are important are. And so I'm going to play in the realms of the things that are. And I'm going to attempt to, you know, talking about getting crushed. I'm going to do, I'm going to use the tools that I have to get out from kind of under the thumb of the things that hurt me. But there is no reason that I have to be pissed off about it all the time. And so there's that side of it. And the second side of it is if we lock down into nothing but the dead serious aspects, we just shut down massive levels of creativity. So if we can really come in and go, yeah, I'm going to completely change my life, my world, and maybe the whole world using magic. And I'm going to view this as interesting, exciting, fun, and play we come to it with all of our creativity intact uh, rather than being really stuck and going, no, I have to be, I have to be actively pissed off about the state of the world while I'm trying to fix it. Right. And this is what I see a lot of going on right now. I never see it work. And so if you can find the game in there, uh, if you can find the sense of even though I'm trying to whatever, bring down the patriarchy, I'm going to be playful about my approach. Doesn't mean you're not serious. You can be extremely serious. There's a lot of forms of play where people die. I think I've brought this up uh, in a podcast already, but I watch a lot of skateboarding videos because I skated for some years. And one of the things that I love about, like lately I've been going through, uh, I think they're called Thrasher Rough Cuts. And so these are, the unedited or less edited uh, maybe 10 minutes of video that skaters put took and then edited down to two minutes of them landing every trick and it is savage (laughs) because they are breaking themselves they are breaking their boards they are beating themselves senseless and they are deeply serious about pulling off the tricks that they want to do and it is incredibly playful And so to me, it's bringing that whole sensibility of, I'm gonna make this happen, but I don't have to be uptight about it. I don't have to be stuck on, I don't have to be self-important about it. It's just, yeah, I'm gonna gonna ride the skateboard off the roof onto that car and then I'm gonna roll away. Uh, To me, that's what serious play is all about. Forget about the pandemic and tools and everything. You're a skater, so you have conquered things physically that I think uh, few people, especially after hearing stories that Tony Hawk and and others have shared. I I absolutely my my respect was already high for you, but it's it's. I was never good. I will say I was never good. I started very late and I did it for four years, but those four years I did spend you know twenty to twenty five hours a week in skate parks. But I never got good, but I did learn so much about this approach of like, you know, if you're going to do this, you're going to get hurt. That's not optional. 
you know, I have, I have woken up not really knowing that I was like, what am I looking at? Oh, I'm looking at Matt's feet because he's in the bottom of a pool with me. I don't really remember right now what happened. <laughs> but I know those are his feet because I know what he wrote on his shoes, you know, so. But I was never good, but I was willing. <laughs> Can you share with the listeners, Aiden, about if they do have this right attitude, if they are willing to, you know, have that play, but also maintain the seriousness as they work these tools, can you share how, how that mentality is important in dealing with something you bring up in the book, which is the concept of contagion in magic? Because you talk about osmosis and kind of things that maybe have an effect on us that we don't even realize about. What is contagion and how can this kind of damage perhaps our sensitivity to the field and the spirit realm? And how do we deal with that? So contagion is like one of the classic magical concepts in the West, though it exists in every culture that I've ever seen magic discussed. They don't have the same word for it, of course. And it's the idea that two things that were once in contact remain in contact until something breaks that attachment. This is, I'm using that word really specific, and it's worth thinking about in the context of Buddhism as well, right? And we may dig into that more, but it's just, I'll throw that out for, there for people. So, things that were once in contact remain in contact until something breaks the attachment between them. I think that more importantly than if we were living in kind of a tribal culture, and maybe I'm going to go and find some of your hair, or I'm going to do something with one of your footprints. These are very cross-cultural ways of working on someone using contagion, right? This, a sorcerer might work on another person or believe someone has worked on them. The thing that's become really interesting to me is what I speak of as cultural contagion. And this is about contagion of ideas and concepts that are so rooted in everything that we see that they often constrain what seems possible to us. So again, if we're talking about all the stuff we were talking about before, if we're looking at social media and advertising and socially acceptable visions of success or of fitting in, the concept of how much money you need to have to be successful in, Amer in the United States, how you need to perceive your gender to be acceptable. These are all forms of contagion. And because of the digital age, if we're tied in, this is a layering of contagion that never stops accruing. It's constant. And the thing that's interesting about contagion to me is you can't actually stop it from happening. It's always happening. So you have to have some way of dealing with it. And some of this is avoidance. So there's shit I don't look at, or I look at in very specific places. There are forms of media that I don't play in anymore. There are people that I have nothing to do with because every time I am around them, I then have to deal with the stuff they leave with me. And it's more work than I'm willing to do. It's not that you can't get rid of it. It's not hard to get rid of, but it's a constant. And I think that the problem that we have in part right now in a lot of places and for a lot of people is due to things like the politicization that is going on right now. And this has been true before this election cycle, though it's particularly obvious right now, is often we'll go, okay, I don't like that. And let's just say that that is the structure of the alt-right or the messaging of the alt-right. And therefore, I'm this, where we've created a dualism, right? And I think that this dualism is kind of constant. You are successful or you are a failure. You are alt-right or you are a liberal. You are thin, and therefore you are acceptable, or you are fat and are therefore not acceptable. All of these are like, it's like contagion that is driving you to different contagion. If you just reject these things, you're nothing like free from them. You're just trading one knee-jerk reaction for another. 
And so to me, if we use the kind of concepts of cleansing this stuff from magic and we use magic to go after these things and we do real work, which is unpleasant, meditation, things like that, deep self-reflection, therapy. And I'm not a huge therapy person, but I did get a lot of it as a young per- from it as a young person when I did it. And again, it ties into that thing that we have to be really healthy to resist this stuff. And if we bring ourselves kind of massively coated with these layers of contagion into our interactions with the spirits and with the field, it doesn't go super well. Because just like the person, I'm going to use an example that is very personal to me. I have a friend that is deeply, deeply unwell on a psychological level because of, I believe, spirit issues that they have no capability of dealing with. I can't be around them. And when I first began not being around them, a lot of folks that I knew were like, you just need to have compassion for them. And it's like, no, this is a different thing because they are carrying spirit energies that I, the only thing I could kind of do to to deal with them is really aggressive work. And I'm not going to do that. Uh, It's not my place to do that. That person, there's nothing wrong with them, but they are so coded in layers and layers of this stuff that everything that they touch is influenced by it. And as magicians, this is to me a very critical concept that if we're coming in, this is not about being spiritually pure at all, but if we're coming in with layers of misunderstanding that our definition of success is controlled by what we see on Instagram or on the news or in People Magazine and all of the less obvious forms of this, our friends Facebook, we're asking for things that don't really make sense for us except in that state, which is not a natural state and it's not a healthy state. And the things that will want to play with us, the allies that we would attract in that state, are probably not the allies that want us to not be like that. They were attracted to us because we were like that. So to me, this is an immense, immense uh, subject that I didn't really even have the space to begin getting into in Weaving Fate. What I love what you do in Weaving Fate, though, Aiden, and I'd love for you to talk about this, is you take these layers of misunderstanding and effectively turn each layer of misunderstanding, each layer of digital pressure, each layer of kind of boxed thinking into, I don't know, let's say 60 trillion train tracks. And you lay them out across this endless horizon of pattern fields and habits. And you really urge the readers in Weaving Fade to get off the tracks that, that whether, as you said, it's Instagram or it's some kind of societal expectation or it's, ah, Here's a political ideology I disagree with. Therefore, I am the exact opposite and always opposing whatever it may be. You always say that one of the important things is about getting off the tracks and that for most people, to quote William Blake, might be ensconced in their own mind forged manacles and that you say it doesn't have to be this hard to get off of the tracks. So can you share a little bit about what does it mean to get off the tracks and how can we kind of disrupt this kind of preset trajectory that we find ourselves in? Sure. Um, So this concept of getting off the tracks came from something that I was shown. I'm not a martial artist, but I did a martial arts seminar once and I've taken a few classes, but I'm terribly, terribly klutzy, which should preclude me from skateboarding, but pads, you know, it's acceptable. Um, (laughs) so I was never very good at it. And so it was always kind of disheartening. I'd be interested to try it now that I'm much older, but I think I have the patience now to do that kind of thing. But anyway, I went to this seminar because Rory Miller was speaking and I really like Rory Miller. Rory is a a very, very interesting guy who's best known for his book meditations on violence and is, I think worth looking into there. There'll be a lot of people probably in our community that have a knee jerk reaction to him that I think is unwarranted, but he was at this thing. And so was a guy named Mark McYoung and Mark McYoung was a kind of street thug, I think in Southern California. 
he eventually got it together, but he wrote a lot of books about what kind of actual street violence was like. And so Mark was talking about this and he was looking at what their response is to threat, right? If somebody gets up in your face and, and in a posture of, of aggression and is clearly going to do some harm to you, what do people do? And this is something that he and Rory have done a lot of work on. And what most people do is they stay in a straight line with that person. So they either have the response to, I'm going to fuck this guy up. And so you charge straight at him or you go, I'm going to run and you turn and you run straight back, right? You're still on the same track. If that person is a train, if that threat is a train, some people will just crumble, right? They just fall on the tracks and go fetal and just lay there to be run over. And he says that what Mark was saying was that the kind of intelligent response to this is to begin moving kind of laterally to get off the tracks. So that the thing that is coming at you at least has to try and pursue you. Right. And this got me thinking, cause I'm a magician and I run everything through this mill of my magic brain, how the way that life options are presented to us in this world is like we're on train tracks. This is the thing that I must have, and I'm going to go straight at it. This is the thing I want to avoid, so I'm going to put the train in reverse, and I'm going to back up, right? But you're still on this, the, on this same line of trajectory. You're still on the same line of fate, whether it's an aversion or an attraction, right? And the option to simply hop off the train either onto a different track that goes somewhere else, often doesn't occur to us. And that's that knee-jerk, right, left, good, bad thing, right? And so if we can begin to learn, and I totally credit my wife for developing this piece of this, just in our talking, like what's the lateral move where that track and its difficulties, whether I'm going forward or backwards or stuck on it, just sitting steady, what is the movement that I can take that just removes me from, and I'm going to use the same concept again, that line of fate? Why do I have to go where I'm either compelled to by desire or aversion? Why is that the option? And I believe that this is part of what the kind of hyper-mediated digital age has produced is this infinity of tracks, most of which won't serve probably anyone except the person who laid them down. And so that's the concept there. You weave this image of the tracks with another very chilling aspect in the book. And I, I'd love if you could, uh, as we were talking about before the podcast, if, if you could read from your book here, this concept of the monolith and what a monolith is as effectively this giant, very imposing concept that it can be a real obstacle. And reading this in your book, it, it was very chilling. What is a monolith? And how can we approach reality with a soft gaze to perhaps work through the monolith, so to speak? Yeah. So this is from the chapter on liminal gnosis, which is a very brief one in Weaving Fate, but it's very related to what we're talking about and to the overall conception of the book. And so this is from page 51, and it says, some of the most obstructive and destructive forces or ideas we encounter are what I call monoliths. Monolith here is used in the sense of a monolithic structure, which is one that has a massive, unchanging, and unchangeable nature. I imagine them as huge black cubes miles across each face set along the horizon. They're the things we are told or trained to believe we need, want, or are afraid of. Desire, war, career, wealth, anger, fear, love, gender, change, stability, power are all monoliths. And each of us has our own specific set arrayed across our vision like mountains. The importance of each of the monoliths is both culturally and individually specific. The huge forms blocking the view of one person may not even exist for another. These monoliths, be they cultural norms, mediated ideals, or colonizing thoughts of any sort, 
are perspective specific, they have manifested in a way that assumes you will approach them as intended, which is always head on like a train on tracks. If you do approach them like that train, you have only a few options. Stop the approach, smash into them, or back up and return the way you came. For them to be effective blockages, you cannot make the logical lateral shift, which is to get off the train or to step off the tracks. And so, for me, the, the, the image of the monolith is the only way I can kind of produce a concrete, I could think of to produce a concrete vision of this thing. Because these things we take so seriously, we believe that they are so important. And it's not to say that they aren't. But the question is, do we have to approach them as we are offered? It's like, um, it's like laying a trap is, is how I think of them. It's like our culture lays traps with the monoliths. And so again, they say your option is approach, flee, go fetal. That's it. You don't have any other options. And because these things are so big and so pervasive, and most of us develop our uh, relationships to the ones that matter so young is another piece, it can be very hard to go, oh, I don't care about that thing. My responses here are purely programmed. I don't actually care about being rich. I don't actually care that my parents claim that my love of someone of the wrong gender will destroy them. That's their thing. That's their track. I don't have to be on it. And so we can do this process intellectually as far as trying to fix this or to come to these points. But in the liminal gnosis chapter, what I'm talking about is liminal gnosis is the idea that there are spaces in between things and the knowledge that comes from the spaces in between. And the example that I use, and this might come from Ray Sherwin, I know that the term does, is that if the ocean is sleep and the shore is wakefulness, the liminal gnosis exists in the shallows there, right? You're in the water, you're on land. Liminal as a conception deals with threshold spaces, edge spaces, where the forest finally starts to thin out and become the plains. There's a section usually where it's a little of both, right? Those are all liminal spaces. And the monoliths and a lot of these other seemingly insurmountable things only hold their power when we kind of approach them in normal waking consciousness, where we're really kind of stuck in the material and our actual vision and kind of traditional problem solving. And if we can come at them instead from this space of liminality, the space in between and go, okay, I have some issues about my desires sexually and my gender or about my physicality in some way, my health or non-health, about the way my mind goes to certain concepts or ideas or internal kind of visualizations that are uncomfortable. If we can take those questions out of a normal consciousness state into more of a daydreamy or light trance state, Often what happens for me and a lot of the folks that I've played with this with is we begin to see that you go, oh, that monolith isn't actually a solid thing. It's like a facade. It looks immense. It looks like it would crush me, but it's gossamer. And there's nothing there. And so if we can bring that kind of in-betweenness, that edge approach, that peripheral vision, kind of tranced out, kind of daydreamy, kind of fantasizing, imagine 
game to this, the serious play aspect of that to this, we can often go, oh, okay, I don't care about career at all. Then we can go, okay, what does this mean? There are issues that I then have to address, right? There's things I don't get to do or that I do get to do. But if we try and just hammer that thing, hating it or lusting after it, well, we're kind of fucked and we don't have to be. And that's what I mean that it's, it doesn't have to be this hard. The game is structured to be that hard, but our experience within it doesn't have to be. For listeners, Aiden, who might be thinking, especially if they haven't either just starting out with your book, like, okay, this is great. I can't wait to change or add to my understanding of reality. You mentioned in the book many times that, uh, no, 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 it's actually, you know, unloading, unburdening, stripping away things. And you, you mentioned in the book that, quote, you know, the soul spirit complex is waiting for the rest of us to catch up, unquote. Can you talk about how some deep part of us already knows and, and has this kind of gnosis and is just waiting for the rest of us to, to catch up and, and stop telling ourselves stories that might be limiting or just illusions. Yeah. So I make a pretty hard distinction between what I call the, the soul spirit complex and the mind. Not everybody does. It's not a, it's not really a critical juncture there. I don't think, but the mind functions and this is, again, the ideas that I've kind of got from Buddhism and other places by storytelling. There are aspects of kind of the soul spirit complex that we can communicate with through storytelling, but that's not what it does. That's the function of the mind. So people will make the argument that humans are the only rational animal. And I would say that we are the animal that makes a story. And in this way, we can rationalize lots of things but I don't know that it's a rational process. So there's all of these things like the monoliths, which are incredibly important to the mind. The train tracks are incredibly important to the mind. These concepts of kind of maintaining things as they are for the well-being of our cultures or our societies, the survival of the body. These things are very important to the mind they don't tend to really be that important to what I am calling the, the, the soul spirit complex. It's way less involved in those parts of this structure. In a way, I, I think that the mind is a, it's an expression of the body, right? And so it's constrained in a way that the spirit is not as constrained. And so one of the ways that this stuff is kind of interesting, the, these practices and how weaving fate has worked out uh, in my experience in those that I've, worked with with this stuff is if you do the work if you actually go at this stuff kind of in the way that are suggested there are parts that will be really a grind i don't deny it but simultaneously what happens is you get a little ways in and things begin to open up because that's where the soul spirit complex can dive in and go yes 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 this is good we'll help you your allies begin to Assist is another way of thinking it. The field isn't locked down into this weird human mind world. That would be, a, in, to me, a really grave delusion to hold that our experience from within the body and with the human minds that we have, understanding all of these layers of contagion and, and programming and conditioning from our cultures and the world and media, this stuff isn't actually real outside of that. It's not saying that the world isn't real. It's just saying our experience of it is confused. There's things that we wouldn't do, right, if we had that perspective, I think. And I think this is why things are so difficult for us right now. Um, we have an immense population of folks who are all, not all, but for the most part, forced onto these tracks and forced to kind of deal with the kind of, again, to use, I think the term you brought up, which is, you know, soul crushing nature of a lot of what's going on in the world. And that stuff's not particularly real. It's not saying those things aren't happening. It's not saying they aren't crushing. It's not saying they aren't damaging, but the core reality of YouTube is extremely limited. 
the core reality of the internet in the much grander scheme of millions upon millions of years of life. These are like nothing things. They're doing intense damage, but they're spiritually empty. And I'm again, not saying this from some kind of weird transcendence point of view. I'm speaking this as the animals. I think that they're, it doesn't make sense. And so I would say that is when we're talking about these, why do we tell ourselves these stories that are illusions and they're limiting? Not everybody does or not to the same degree. And really nobody does it about everything. But functionally, it's like programming and habit and the kind of discursive, recursive nature of the mind to continue to spin story that may not be accurate over and over and over again. You also draw a distinction in your book about the ideas of subjectivity versus objectivity, and even that being kind of a false dichotomy. But so many people are obsessed with these ideas of, okay, is it subjective? Is it objective? Am I working on myself in an objectively subjective way? What does this mean? So, can you just kind of share with us in, in the book, what is subjectivity and objectivity and, and how are both of these kind of related to what you consider and talk about in the book as being truth? What I think is going on is that there are two things at play. There's the things that we experience through the mechanisms that we experience, right? So our physical senses and our psychic senses, and then kind of the mental formations that occur because of those. And then there's everything else. And the idea of objective truth is incredibly weird to me because everything that can be perceived is filtered. You know, we're that filter. Each of us individually is that filter. And to remove that filter means you've removed the observer. So everything is to some degree subjective. This doesn't deny that there are physical facts which we experience directly or that are repeatable, right? You know, you hit a bone hard enough with a stick, it breaks. So we're not talking on that level. But I think where this usually comes up is about the experiences we have in magical practices and in liminal states. And I would say that those things are only ever subjectively true. I think the belief that they are objectively true is what leads us to most forms of religion, which I'm not really a fan of. Nothing against it. It just doesn't make sense to me. I have seen and experienced too many very peculiar things that had far, far, far more impact on my life path, on who I am, on how I feel about the world than anything that happened objectively in the physical. And so to me, it's, it's, it's objective truth is, it's a weird concept. It's like, it's like a mathematical abstraction. I always kind of think it's, it's interesting when people say things like, you know, I'm against psychedelics or mind altering substances and I don't do any of that stuff. And then you look at them as an individual completely sober, completely there. And if you look at the mammalian neurotransmitters, you are nothing but a cocktail of dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin and your individual makeup is filtering to use your point, the world in, in such a unique way that someone could be standing right next to you and you can't replicate that cocktail, so to speak. You can't replicate that individual subjectivity. And yet all of us are so obsessed, or, or as you mentioned, many institutions might be obsessed with pushing this kind of objective reality. It's just, it just seems like a total contradiction. It's very weird. It's, um, and yeah, I have that same thing. So you like think about it and you go, okay, I am skateboarding in Sedona, Arizona, which is the best location for a skate park in the world. Because every time you kind of come up to the edge of the one of the pools or whatever you're looking at over this amazing landscape. And it's the most gorgeous thing ever. And I'm flowing and everything is perfect. And then I come off the board and I break a rib hitting the edge of the thing. I am experiencing something completely different in the exact same place. I don't see it as beautiful, right? I'm not in the flow. Yeah. What has changed? 
all of those chemicals have changed, right? <laughs> I've done this massive instantaneous shift in my body chemistry. And so it's very interesting. And I think it's one of those things that is hard for people to accept because then they believe that there is no ground to stand on, right? If I do not view all of these things that I'm experiencing as concretely true and accurate, then what do I know, right? And I think it's Pema Chodron who speaks about becoming grounded in groundlessness, understanding that there's nothing permanent. Everything passes. Every moment shifts to the next. Your body chemistry is shifting, shifting to the next. And this will actually come up in a later question that I know you have for me. And so we'll see if I remember to bring it back around. But if not, I'll see if you catch it and you can bring it back around. You introduce and really take deep dives into the individual tools. There are three main tools and procedures that you share in the book. And the first one is the black book. Um, this is absolutely incredible. I think listeners who have already experienced working with the black book have talked about the deep changes it has, but can you just share Aiden about the underlying technique of the black book? What is this? What is this all about? Essentially at its root, the black book is a false journal. It's a journal of things that have not happened in any definition of the real world that most people would have as if they did. And it's essentially a way of conjuring. It's a, a way of conjuring change through this, you know, it's another term for it. You could, you could view it as a book of lies, right? This is the telling true lies part of the, the subtitle of the book. Talking about subjectivity, something that, as you mentioned, is so important and putting your own individual fingerprint, quote unquote, on this, you walk through and grimoireic magicians will be very familiar with this, but in, in a totally unique light, you walk through about making and consecrating the black book, much like a Libra Spiritum, but again, in a totally different light. And you mentioned to do this putting together a charm bag. I found this fascinating. Can you sh share with the listeners a little bit about the purpose behind the charm bag and what the different elements of the charm bag are? The charm bag is a very simple road opening talisman or tool kind of taking the form of, you know, the one that people know is kind of mojo hands or mojo bags, but these things exist in every culture that I've ever seen, um, which is a container of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, materia, as we call it in, in, in magic speak. And it's basically crossroads dirt and a few other things that the crossroads dirt is the only thing required. And it is enchanted to open kind of those threshold states and open up uh, the roads we wish to walk so that everything else flows more easily down those pathways. You talk about the proper way to make an entry and you really stress how you need to focus on the critical bits and to be open about the rest. Can you just kind of share with us, Aiden, about the basics of how do you make a good entry versus an entry that might lead to restrictions or limitations or, or problems later on? It's kind of involved, which is why there's so much of the book that has to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, we can, make a go for, we can make a go of it. What I found from doing this, even sigil work or a lot of magic work is it ties into that, what I call the feeling sense in the book of what is the actual experience, not the visuals, right? Not I got this amazing vehicle, right? Car, or plane or something. And it's this make, it's this model, these things that we would be told in a lot of systems are really important, right? That those are the critical pieces. We have to be explicit about every aspect of the thing that we want to manifest. And what I found is that if instead I focus on the experience of being with that thing, so if it's a car, what is my experience driving the car? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? What am I seeing out of the windows? What am I internally thinking about as I'm driving, right? We kind of do the drivey daydreamy thing, thinking about different things. And if we do this and focus on those critical bits, which is your after 
in most cases, an experience. It's not that we're after being rich if we can't do anything with it, right? Or being wealthy or having enough money. That's not what we're after. There's something we can do. There's something we can experience. It's not that we, you know, want a relationship with someone who looks like Michelle Rodriguez. There's a way that we would feel if we had that thing. And that is the important bit. Part of why this is so important is it really goes after the heart of the issue and leaves everything wide open. So if I am looking to, we could be really concrete. I want to be in a relationship with Michelle Rodriguez. Then there is only one possible way that that could come about, right? Somehow I have to meet Michelle Rodriguez and she has to fall in love with me. This seems unlikely. But if there's a way, there's something that I see or that I feel that is connected to that image. And if I can go after that feeling that there's something there, what would it feel like to wake up with my arms around a person that I believe you know, fills that that role is, is, is that kind of character in my mind is producing. What does that feel like? What does the bed feel like? What is it like with the sun coming through the room? Somehow this opens kind of the floodgates of possibility because there's a million people that that could potentially happen with. I don't have to target this person who looks like this. Because what I, all I really care about is what do I feel like? What is my experience? Do they treat me well? Do they turn me on? Do I turn them on? Do we treat each other with respect? Do we have a good life? Those are the important bits. We tend to go after these really specific things, and I don't think it works very well for most people. To walk us through this kind of journey of, as you mentioned, focusing on the feeling, focusing on the critical bits, you introduce us to X. And of course, listeners, if you've not read the book, obviously check the link in the video description to definitely would encourage you to pick up a copy of Weaving Fate. Can you give us the broad strokes? Because as you mentioned, Aiden, this is so deeply involved and it is a wonderful, I mean, an incredibly moving journey to read through. But can you tell us about X and the idea to share this amazing journey of journal entries and how X uses the Black Book to grow and to walk down that path to realize her reality. One of the interesting things is that I've done this a lot. I've done this process a lot. And when I started writing about it, I realized that there was no way to write about what I actually do unless I just did it, right? And being spirit-driven, I basically did a little bit of work and said I would like to connect with someone who would like to be uh, the kind of protagonist of this section of the book. And when I did that, I then walked back inside and sat down at my computer and began typing X's journal. And it was like I could see her. And it's like I still can. And that's not to say that I didn't write it. It's just that we worked together, I think. it's a, And this could be a sub piece of me or it could be you know, multidimensional connection. We have a strong, strong connection, but there's things that X cared about that I didn't care about and vice versa. I think it's the only way to let somebody in to what the process actually is for me and for X was to let them see the journal. And so we just ran with it for months and pieces of it stayed and some pieces of it didn't. And there were particular things that were really surprising that came out of it. But I wanted people to be immersed in it enough that they could go, okay, this isn't what I want. These aren't my issues that I need to work on, but I can see it. Because that's the thing that I think is missing in, in a lot of practical magic is what we get is we get the recipe, but we can't taste it. And I wanted people to be able to taste it. And one of the things that I actually a thought about, and I know that there have to be readers who thought about this first, and you already took care of it in the book, which is, oh my gosh, what if I'm doing this journaling, I'm entering in the black book, is everything I enter in the black book permanent? Can I undo things? Can I change things? So, can you, can you just kind of share, Aiden, about how 
if you find you need to change directions with your entries in realizing that reality, that, that it's okay. There's several pieces here that are relevant, which is, I believe all of our actions are permanent. And so you don't get to get away from that. Again, magic does not circumvent reality. And so there is a way that if you do magical work to ask for something, that ask is out there. And so that's a real thing. However, I don't find it problematical. And there are two things that go on with me, with the black book, and you see, you'll see X playing with this quite a lot, which is if you're going after those kind of felt experiences and you're being coherent, and coherent here has a very specific meaning, and it's something that I uh, have fully adopted from my friend Fabiku Fatumiche, whose first book of poetry is coming out very shortly on Revelor Press, and then I believe he's got at least two more coming out with Revelor. And he speaks about coherency as in coherent light, right? So if we have diffused light, the light is just going everywhere, right? This is what most of us do with our minds most of the time. They're just kind of churning around. We're thinking about work, we're thinking about school, we're thinking about the kids, we're thinking about things that happened in the past, we're thinking about things we would like to have happen, but there's no, there, nothing's in alignment. If we align all of our kind of processes, and this is specifically important to the mind and our actual magic work, into a coherent kind of beam of light, this is like a very focused beam of light or like a laser, right? If we work in a really coherent fashion, and this is also why there's so much kind of inner work that I push, because we have to not be working across purposes. If we do that and we hunt those, that kind of feeling sense of the individual experiences as primary, there's usually not much problem that we asked for something and then it didn't come back, come about, or it did come about. For things that are really obvious, like if I fuck up and I write something and it's really a chain that I don't want, I just rip the pages out of the book, write cancel on them in red ink and throw them away and then continue. And I don't worry about it. Probably this comes from doing sigil magic because I am a firm believer that the best way to do sigil magic is to do a fuck ton of it. I do shoals of sigils that are sometimes in the 30 and 40 range. If we're asking for things that overall are pointed in the right direction, what we tend to get is a life that reflects that. And this is one of the strange things for me with the black book and the method that I put forward. I do get exact hits every once in a while where I've maybe imagined being somewhere and someone says a particular thing to me and they are wearing something and I've described their clothes or they're wearing a particular scent or something. And occasionally that happens, but it's usually incidental. But what I find is that the overall thrust of the book begins to manifest. Uh, And so it's really not a, I don't see that there's much issue there. Uh, And again, you can't actually undo it. So it's kind of just uh, overriding, meaning you write a lot more about the things that you do want. It's, uh, and again, kind of going back to the metaphor of the ship in, in six ways, it's steering. You're, you're constantly steering. People have a tendency to hit a place going, oh, I did that wrong. I'm going to start another, a new book. And it's, it's, it's like driving home every time you take a wrong turn. It doesn't make any sense to me. You mentioned as well, Aiden, in the book, especially when making individual entries, however many you make, you do not date pages in the black book. You, you really make a point not to have a specific timestamp on individual entries. Can you share about why that's so important? I'm really pragmatic and I'm really do my best to not be stuck. (laughs) And I don't always succeed. And so a lot of the things that I do are simply realizing that, that things tend to happen in particular ways. And so unless there's a really good reason for me to fight that, I don't fight the current. I try and work with the current. And for me, what I've found is that most systems are nonlinear. And I think the, the field itself is massively non, nonlinear. And so to try and really nail down timelines, to me, this is not the best work for that. 
people do it. Some people have claim, claim to have pretty good success with it, but I'm not one of them. Um, if I needed to do really time sensitive work, I would be doing something else. What I'm really looking for is a complete coherent trajectory. And so, uh, dating things, worrying about things happening in order. Shit does not happen in order in my books. I'm writing uh, entries that are damn near when I'm on my deathbed to entries that happened three years ago to entries that are happening tomorrow to entries that are happening in five years. And then some things that are really cool that occur so we could say, real things, right? I had this conversation with you today. That might make it into my black book, and then it functions kind of like a robofish, to use, you know, Gordon White's term. So, yeah, nonlinear works better is why. <laughs> you mentioned that it's really important when making these entries to avoid creating a counterforce in the entries to other events that have happened, and that because if you do create a counterforce, in the entry that could act as a form of contagion. Can you just kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, that one's, again, it's kind of like the last one in the sense that it primarily seems unnatural and it produces more unnatural effects. One of the reasons that I do these works as I lay out in the black book is there's a kind of known weirdness to how magic plays out that most people that have been successful will say like things can often you see a lot of references to this in books where people say often things will come about by the worst possible way that you get what you want, right? Um, the approaches that I kind of lay out here are the ones that I've found do the least of that. And so I do this, these changes in the corridor. And for whatever reason, that doesn't produce this kind of weird counterforce. I don't know really how else to describe it. It's one of those things that it's purely experiential, and I don't know that I have a lot of theory behind it. You mentioned that when you are avoiding contagion, when you are making a proper entry, quote unquote, and you're throwing out the timestamps, and, and you're, you're kind of following this path, that the goal or one of the goals is to work on the black book on multiple levels. And this helps foster what you call these recursive cycles, these, these positive feedback loops. Can you share a little bit about the incredible kind of exponential curve upwards, like power of these positive feedback loops and, and, and how the black book can help achieve that. Right. So probably the best example of this that I could say is if we look at what's going on in the world that is not good, I would say what we have is kind of these recursive negative feedback loops, right? We have a lot of unpleasant, unbeneficial we'll just say to both, you know, general life on the planet and to most human life, things going on, and they are constantly feeding back into each other. And so they grow in strength, right? So we're kind of doing the opposite here. And so the best example that I have of this is like, if I'm looking for a lover, this is one of the things that comes up in the book, I don't go and start writing about one person, even if it's an imagined person, again, playing with that feeling sense with that, what is my experience of being with these people? And what I think happens is I think that the field and the allies then can kind of translate, right? Because we're basically feeding this stuff both into our deep minds to use Jane Free's terms into the field and into the allies when we're doing this work is how I think about it. We're feeding it to the weavers this is our way or one of the ways we're getting into the web and we're getting our fingers deep in the web. And so what happens through doing this is if I were to pick one person or one description of a person and strictly focus on that, everything that I'm saying then is very clear to, I believe all of the other players, including my deep mind that, what I believe is that there is one person who will provide this to me and we need to find that one person. And so it's overly specific about things that aren't really important. 
Whereas if I go, okay, I, I had this experience with this woman, I had this experience with this other woman, I had this experience with this guy, these are the ways that I felt about all of those experiences. What tends to happen is we begin to have those experiences with people. And we, at least from this side of this, and again, I learned through trial and error on all this stuff, that's what we're after anyway. And as we tell these tales, so this could be different job possibilities, imagining ourselves in different living situations. In a very strange fashion, if all of these things are positive, if all of these are scenarios that we would like to be in, if all of these are experiences we would like to experience, what seems to happen is that we or the allies or the universe or however you want to view it, reorganizes things in a way that our life begins to reflect those experiences, which to me is, again, the, the positive feedback loop in action. It's just generating more and more of a clear vibe, a clear energetic explanation of this. This is why I think I mentioned this in the interview I did with Chowan recently, but I'm not sure if it's in the part that got recorded or not. I knew this guy that as a test did a few entries that involved him like getting into physical altercations. Like, and I was just blown away. I was like, really? And he was completely sold on the whole process after he got his ass kicked twice. So you just want to be, you throw in all of the good stuff that you are after. This could be environmental, right? This is changes that are positive to the entire society. This is changes that are positive to the entire ecology of the planet or to a bioregion. This is not limited to just you asking for things for you. And that leads to a, a few listener questions we have that, that kind of talk about this, especially when it comes to liminality and boundaries and things like that. One of them is from Spectro Poetics, who is asking... I'd love to hear Aiden's thoughts on a collaborative black book. How would one go about it? Is it even judicious or is entwining several people and their fate patterns perhaps not the best idea? I play epistolary games with close friends and I'm struck by their magical potential, as I'm sure many who've been involved in role playing games must be. Does Aiden have advice, ideas or warnings to jumpstart my experimentation? <laughs> so I have like this huge tattoo across my back that says does not play well with others. That's not really true, but, <laughs> and so I had to actually, I have to back up on here because to me, this would not be judicious. I don't spend much time with anybody except my wife and that is entirely intentional. So to me, no, but that doesn't mean that it's a bad idea for people that like people and have people that are willing to dive in this way. Uh, consciously. I think that there's no issues. Otherwise, I would have major consent issues. This is why I tend to leave specific people out of my black book work, because to me, it's, there's consent issues there. Rather than go into the how, I'm going to say that what you're speaking of is the root function of group or tribal mythology and stories. In other words, this is what is used to create group identity, cohesion, group spirit allies, and it's going on all the time. Understanding that and understanding that the nature of, in my understanding of things, of these actions is that generation of group identity, group cohesion, group taboos, group mores, and is essentially... In this case, if everyone is consenting and knows what's going on, group conditioning and programming, uh, I see no problem with we, it. goes on absolutely in essentially every religion and every culture on the planet. It goes on in every tribal group on the planet. It goes on in every military unit on the planet. They aren't doing it as consciously as we would be, but it's absolutely, it's the root of this. Understanding that one of the biggest things that opened up my eyes about all this stuff was realizing that when I was reading tribal mythologies from around the world, that this is what was going on. It's not a description of reality. It's the creation of a group reality for better or worse. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it really touches on the point you underscored a few moments ago about 
subjectivity. And, and I know that anthropologists and others have written about this you know, concept of intersubjectivity, where you can have this kind of group collective, but instead of saying, ah, here's the subjective reality that exists completely concretized in space-time, whatever that is, and we're going to react to it. Instead, it's, it's creating this kind of intersubjective reality. Would that be a somewhat fair way to characterize I it? I think so, yeah. I, I know of one group who I won't mention for their own benefit that actively really does this, that they are actively generating their own mythology to create essentially a modern tribal culture. And they're very aware that what they're doing is attempting to generate enough kind of data points with enough power to overwrite the kind of cultural conditioning that we're raised in. So it's absolutely that thing. One of the things that I believe is implicit in weaving fate that I don't think anyone has mentioned to me yet is there's a lot of stuff that I choose not to say in books because I don't think the book is the best place to say it. And so places like this are much better. To me, the processes described in weaving fate are probably the best, the most likely in my perspective to be successful way to change the trajectory of this planet. That if a vast, vast, vast number would remove themselves, or at least partially remove themselves, from the kind of knee-jerk reactions that we have to kind of the horrors of what are going on, and actively work to generate as many coherent kind of crystalline, tasteable, tangible, palpable visions of a better reality, I think that that will fucking do way more than let's hex whoever we think is the bad guy. Again, to your point and about the tattoo that is across your back is that one can take the reins of their own fate and begin weaving in a collective sense, as, as you mentioned, to have this kind of global impact or become a unique tributary into perhaps a larger impact, but doing it as an individual, as, as someone just kind of making solo entries into the black book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That does not have to be group work at all. It's one of the things that I include very heavily in my stuff is a lot of projections out 50 years down the line where things are much better than they are. And I do not reference how. It's again, go with the feeling of it. Don't go with the method because that's an unnecessary constraint and I don't think it helps with manifestation. Well, Aiden, in terms of going with the feeling, uh, we do have a listener question from Kate Crane. And I'm wondering if this applies to Kate's question, which is, could Aiden please discuss pacing in regards to the Black Book? How often does Aiden tend to write in his Black Book? And how much does he tend to linger in a particular storyline? That's a really good question. And I have to kind of think about it. It comes and goes. I go into, I hit places where I feel like I'm in the current and I'm in the flow and everything is rolling. And I will write sometimes, no exaggeration, dozens of pages a day for weeks. And then I fall out of the flow and I don't worry about it. I continue feeding it. Mine tends to live underneath my head at the bed. So it's getting energy there. I do that that work with it. And I have gone sometimes a year or two without writing in one, depending on what's going on, where things really fell into the flow and I could kind of watch everything playing out. And I wasn't really, I didn't feel the need to steer. And then I'll hit a point again where I begin to write. More commonly, I'll write, I don't know, two, three entries a day sometimes for a couple of weeks, and then I'll be off for a couple of weeks or just write one in there. It, it's very random. It's, it's, I make no attempt to control it. I go with the feeling. To that point, we have a question from Jessica Irene, who, when it comes to consecrating the Black Book and the ritual of consecration, Jessica's asking, Aiden talks about having used the technique of writing letters to himself prior to establishing the Black Book practice. Were there other methods, Jessica's asking, that he attempted that were similar? Are there imaginative ways to apply principles of these diary-like methods to one's existing relationship to spirits? How I do this, I, I, was, I was almost going to say I don't, but that's not true. I do do this, and I do it by... 
I don't keep a magical journal. I'll throw that out there. I did, but I don't. And part of it is because I got really irritated with my own kind of uh, questioning of things after the fact. So I do not keep one. I do keep something like that in the black books that I work. And this is something that Lee Morgan talks about in uh, his really excellent book, Standing and Not Falling. And it's kind of in the first chapter, if I'm remembering correctly, which is I do record any really intensely successful magic as kind of reinforcement. And again, I use this as kind of a robofish approach. So I do write down, that's where I write down my intense contacts with spirits sometimes. And it's, to me, it's the same thing. It's, it, it's a consent issue. I would ask and see what it feels like. I'm kind of extreme on the consent front as far as a lot of people might be for anybody that falls into the camp that I care about, which my spirits are true. I do very, very little negative kind of hexing work, anything like that. It's been a very long time since I felt any benefit to do so because I think there are more efficient ways to get what I want going. And the only reason why that is kind of acceptable is I by default don't care about those people anymore. And so I would, I'd be using whatever method you use to ask and saying, Hey, this is making sense to me. Uh, would you like to play that way? Otherwise, recording your experiences, I think, are fun. And it does seem to add a bunch of power to the project. To kind of tag along to that, especially when it comes to these kind of existing practices, Jessica, Irene has another question for you, Aiden, which is for those who are interested in implementing the Black Book hypersigil approach, but who are also practitioners of divination, like astrology, does Aiden have any advice or anecdotes that he could share about how one might go about fate weaving in a way that serves to complement a practice that is largely, or at least significantly, deterministic? Yeah, I mean, I don't know anything about astrology practically, so it's hard to answer that specifically, but I did extensive work with the runes when I began doing this stuff, where I was laying out lots as described in the book where I was talking about kind of um, the languaging of some of my ideas behind this stuff and the Reeds of Sorcerer and Warlock and things like that. And that worked well. I don't know how you would do that with astrology. The thing that comes to mind and probably is coming from an ally, but it's not a really heavy one, so I can't claim that officially. Um, sometimes it's really obvious when they're doing it and sometimes it's not. But the suggestion may be to look at places that are traditionally problematical for you and note how those things are not problematic for you anymore. So if there is a particular, I don't even know what you call these things, moment astrologically that you believe would be rough for you, write it as being super awesome instead. See what happens. Let me know. I'm interested in that one. So you uh, do this incredible job laying out this, this first major tool, the black book and the consecration process and how to do entries. And you introduce us to the wonderful X. And then there is another tool that you introduce, which is called the corridor. Can you just kind of give us the broad strokes of the corridor, but also kind of share the relationship between the black book and the journal entries there and how that relates to the corridor? A lot of my trance work journeys were laid out kind of as is mentioned in six ways with the tower work and then with kind of crossroads visualizations. But one of the things that I began working with was a vision of this endless corridor of doors and the, the doors were particular moments in time and places. And so if I wanted to influence something at a particular moment. And I think we talked about this earlier, like if there was a point where something could have happened differently, and I think that the outcome for me would have been different. I decided to see if I could use this, this idea of this visualization of these corridors of endless doors to find those places and then kind of change the weight of those events in a direction that I wanted. And um, it works very well. And so the vision is strictly any corridor that you could imagine with doors on either side that goes on forever. And in that you could find, this is all imaginal work. And so this is where the serious play comes to mind. In that corridor, you could find any moment in your life and you just walk 
doesn't matter which direction you walk. Some people, you know, choose that if, however you would know, I don't know, because it's an endless corridor, but walking one direction is headed back into the past and the other is walking into the future. I don't usually do that, but I've had some experience with that. And you walk down the corridor until you find a door that feels right. For me, it's all about feel. Some people will see like light under the door or the door itself will be lit up in some way. I'm really not visual, so it's just feel. And you walk in and there is that moment in time. That is a place you can play. That's the first thing. And it's that endlessness that is critical because it moves us everywhere. Again, something that's not covered in the book is it's an interesting thing to play beyond this lifetime. We won't get too specific because X's journey is just wonderful and, and really has to be read in the context of the entire Weaving Fate book. But just to give listeners a sense of this, and I'm doing this from memory, Aiden, so please forgive me, uh, is an example of the corridor is X drops into the corridor and is walking the endless corridor and finds a door that feels right and opens it. All of a sudden, X is in her childhood bedroom and her father is yelling at her because she had an altercation at school because she kept getting bullied and, and the father's basically freaking out and, and yelling at her, whatnot. And then adult X walks into from the corridor into this specific room, aka specific memory. And it's at that point that yourself and X really share the importance of working with these specific memories, you know, talking to your or observing your childhood self. Can you just kind of share what you think readers or listeners could know when they do pick up a copy of the book about working with memories? Yeah. So one of the things that defines our sense of self is our memories. And this is, I think, why if we go back to the kind of Norse stuff, there's a piece in, in the Havamal where Odin is talking about his ravens, thought and memory. And he basically says that he fears that his thoughts may go away someday, but he more fears that his memories would, right? Because the memories are what define us in a lot of ways. This is often not a good thing because of multiple layers. One is that memory is not accurate, right? It's if we're talking about subjectivity, objectivity. Memories change over time. Your neurology changes over time. The perspective that you experienced the memory in may have been caused you to have a flawed understanding of what you saw. There's lots of things. This is not, I'm not against memory. It's not that at all. It's just realizing that they have great power. And so what I found and what X finds in the corridor work is that rather than going in and changing the event that happened, not against it as a practice. I've played there. I didn't like it. Coming in and interacting with myself as a younger person at that moment of experience and kind of being the, the perfect mentor from the perspective of what I know now, who they were, who we became, is an incredibly potent tool to begin to take the negative power, because these are generally not positive memories that we're talking about in this case. And if you think of that as like a, a stereo signal, right? Or your phone signal, it's like turning the volume down on the original memory is one way you could think about it. And another way you could think about it is like, if you have ever played in recording software on your computer or whatever, you record a track of you speaking, right? And it's very clear. If you record another track of you speaking, it becomes less clear. If you record a hundred tracks of you speaking, it becomes nothing, right? It becomes just sound. Um, and so some of what we're doing is we are changing the weight of our memories so that we change the weight of their effects on us in the present. Yeah, that was, I mean, it was so incredible to read that uh, just to take that example. So in terms of lessening the weight, you know, X talking to her childhood self saying, Hey, I know you're upset right now. I know your dad's yelling at you because you had that altercation in school, but you know, your dad is a good guy and he's just worried because he heard about the violence and you kind of pushing back even rightfully against this bully. But I know he's yelling, 
but it's okay. And he's just concerned about you. He's a good guy. And reading that and reading how, just as you said, it's not changing what happened. It's not changing the dad coming in and, and yelling at child X. But at the same time, even reading that, Aiden, it really, I almost felt this kind of like immediate empathy, like, oh my gosh, if I was in X's shoes at that point, you could almost feel the weight changing, the weight lifting. I mean, it was, it was just an amazing way that, that you and X laid this out. It's a really intense process, or it has been for me and again, for most people that I know, it is not subtle. <laughs> is what I would say. You know, it was it was funny when you said that there were parts in the book where you were like having kind of really solid emotional things. This was crazy writing this stuff because I was as well. Because to me, it was like it was new. It was like I was reading it. And there were chunks where I was like going, holy fuck, even though I've done some of this stuff, it's <laughs> got that current in it, right? Because these things are often very clear reflections of stuff that I've done in huge volume. And it is very common for me to come out of the corridor work with that sense of just like, I don't feel like the same fucking person. And that was nothing. That was some fucking idiot when I was in sixth grade being a douche. But there's such a weird thing when that it is, it's like, it's just removing weight. And again, it's kind of helpful if we think about it in relationship to currents and the ship and things like that from six ways that these are all things that impact the travel of the ship. They affect its ability to flow in the current. And so as we kind of remove that weight, it's just like the ship writes itself and is able to really cruise. And it's crazy uh, in a way. I will say that it is not one of the funniest things that I got. I did get one kind of somebody who said, I don't understand why you think this stuff would work. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed and I said, because I've done it. Uh, I said, if you do it wholeheartedly, I would be surprised if you would come back to me in a year and to say that. Because nobody that I know that has dove in and really done the work has anything other than like, this shit's pretty whack. It's pretty over the top. Even just an initial read of X's story and, and I had this strong emotional response for the positive, feeling that weight lift. And I thought, oh my gosh, like when I start doing my own corridor work, you know, this is going to take it to an even new level. And Aiden, what really blew my mind, I'd love for you to share about this too, is say after that experience, just to go back to the ex example of talking to her childhood self, uh, talking about, you know, her dad coming into the room and yelling at her. And then X goes back and makes a journal entry in the black book. And so this is where these two procedures kind of get uh, married together where X says, hey, I dropped in, quote unquote, to the corridor today and had a chat with my childhood self. We talked about the issue with my dad. And, you know, here's to your point, here's how I feel about that. Here's what happened as a result of that conversation. Can you share about that, about dropping into the corridor, having these very interesting, intense, vulnerable interactions, opening the doors to these specific memories, not changing them necessarily, but, but having an interaction there and then going back and making an entry into the black book. Can you talk about that relationship? The best way that I can describe it is we have all of this misinformation fed to us, right? This is what we're talking about is cultural programming, things like that, the monoliths, right? These are, this is all basically externally driven, very heavily weighted data that we use to define ourselves for the most part. And people do this to very different degrees. So it's not like everybody's in the same boat as far as level of this stuff goes on. And part of what happens with the work of Weaving Fate, and this is why the things are, there's three pieces in there and why I suggest people work all of them. And usually if somebody comes and says, this piece isn't working very well, I can usually tell which piece they're not doing or which piece they're not comfortable doing. This is that process of recursive feedback loops. And what we're basically doing is we're attempting to produce, and I think this is the language I use in the book, an overwhelming body of evidence that our life history and our life experience is other than what we have been telling ourselves. And it totally changes our experience in the present. And it opens up this vast array of possibilities that were previously closed to us. It's just a huge thing. It's almost like, 
the more you tear yourself open and really dedicate to either journal entries or the corridor, the more, and this goes to your point about how strange it is, strange in the positive sense, the more you feel this kind of healing, this kind of weight lifted, you know? I'm amused because I, I don't know, but I will be really interested to know. Somebody will know. I've quoted this on one podcast before, and it's probably this one. We'll just see, because that would be beautifully recursive. There's a line from Josh Homme in the Queens of the Stone Age. I don't remember the name of the song. Maybe it's the Vampires of Time and Memory, where he says, to be vulnerable is needed most of all if you intend to truly fall apart. And to me, that's the critical, one of the really critical messages to this stuff is, there's a way you have to come into magic really, really strong or become really strong through it. But this isn't about not feeling. It's about being incredibly vulnerable and feeling intensely. And so sometimes I've had these experiences going into the corridor where I'll go to a particular time and just watch. And it's like, what am I seeing if I engage that liminal sense, right? And you go, damn, that guy was fucking terrified, right? He was fucking terrified of what was going on. And that is why he kind of lashed out at me. And as a child or whatever, I took it really hard. I took it really bad. What I saw as a child was this big person unleashing their power on me indiscriminately. What I see going back sometimes is like, this is a terrified animal who absolutely had no fucking power. And it was a misreading. And so there's nothing to even change. It's just kind of like you go, oh, well, that's different. And you walk out of there and it totally changes a bunch of stuff down the road. And that's the biggest thing about the corridor working is the corridor working for me is the thing where it's one of those places where you get really lateral effects where you go, wait a second, I did all this stuff in the corridor in the last month. And there's a bunch of shit that has been hard for me for my entire life as I could remember it that isn't hard anymore. And you can't even see a relationship to them. It's a, it's a very unique effect to me. It's like all of a sudden you look back and go, wait a second, what the heck? This thing is getting resolved or it's changed. Or I, I, I loved your phrasing on the weight getting lifted. And I didn't even think that these two things were related because I was so focused in the corridor on this specific memory, on this specific incident that I didn't, I didn't see the cross pollination with this completely quote unquote other thing, but yet it's immediately affected. Right. And that's, I think the biggest thing with all this stuff is, is, if we kind of view this thing that the field itself is this tapestry, this weaving, and then we are woven parts within it, everything is so connected. And this is again, why everything is so subjected, right? What I see sitting in my chair in this room that I've spent a gazillion hours making jewelry and though I don't do that anymore is completely different from second to second because I'm changing all the time. And when we go hard after those changes, those kind of root changes, that is the thing where you go like, oh, wait a second. I would have felt shame in this situation because I said something stupid maybe, right? Or I would have felt justified to be cruel in a situation. I didn't do anything tied into those things. I didn't do any work on those things, but we've changed the weight that skews us in that direction. It's a peculiar thing. And it's why I do suggest a couple of places like this is kind of the best method for kind of radical transformation I've found. Yeah. And just when you had me vulnerable, torn open, you know, doing work, and, and this is only after, you know, a few entries and a few sessions in the corridor, then you introduce the reader, Aiden, to the third tool, which is the fever stone. And how the fever stone, this, this new and third major tool that you focus on in Weaving Fate, connects and is interwoven with the corridor work, which is interwoven with the black book, and how all three of those have these positive feedback loops. But can you just tell us a little bit about the fever stone and the genesis of the fever stone in terms of how you were first introduced to this tool? Yeah, 
we spoke about this last time I was here. I know the kind of root of this is that there's a place in the West in, in, in the trance worlds that I go into. And there I met a kind of a hive kind of spirit organism thing. <laughs> I don't know what they are. I went to call them um, that I call the sisters and another being that, there that is a barrow dwelling kind of death power called the that I call the night mother. And these are really death oriented creatures, whatever they are. That is their thing. They work with the dead and they find kind of our attachments to being alive somewhat peculiar. But anyway, I went to them with some problems because they've been really helpful and they introduced me to another set of spirits, which I call the brothers. And the brothers present to me as Neanderthal hunter-gatherers. Um, they're like a Neanderthal hunting tribe. They don't do a lot of gathering. And the brothers are really intense. They don't speak, but they tend to kind of project information really easily. Or they've never spoken to me verbally, meaning there's no, I don't have a sense of them talking to me. But they are very good at kind of talking in my head. The sisters actually talk. And the brothers taught me the fever stone process. And so that is entirely from them. And what they basically said is that the fever stone is, the, there's multiple aspects of it, but it's basically calcified trauma. And that is the, the root of what the fever stone is um, that makes us very sick and that they have a method for clearing that. Uh, which is what I teach in the book. And of course, listeners will definitely you know, have to pick up a copy of Weaving Fate for your really beautiful step-by-step -step sharing. Um, but the Fever Stone has this process. And of course, however deep you would like to get into it, but it is a, a very, very intensive process of visualizing specific steps on how to locate a fever stone, how to create and visualize your own temple and working space in the visual realms to extract the stone from your second self. And then there's a whole process you introduce about feeding this now consumed with all the dross burned off stone, this kind of essence, this energy of the fever stone after it goes through this process to a golden dragon and how you can reclaim these stones. I mean, this is an incredibly beautiful and intense process. Can you just kind of give us the broad strokes in, in terms of why you structured this specific kind of transmutive process in this way? This one is really easy because I didn't. This is how I was taught it. This is straight up the transmission from the brothers. And so... I shared it as best as I could based on what they showed me and told me and then expressed a little bit more of that, of my own experience with it, because there were pieces that I already had in place. So they taught me the process of washing the stone, right? And the washing the stone is the first part. Yeah, I don't even know that I'm going to go into that, but it's really that they taught it to me. And the only piece that I can really lay claim to is the building of the temple because I already had the temple built. So that was where I went to go practice because they were really clear, like you do this thing slowly and you practice and that's important. When someone who is able to wash the stone and access this essence, can you talk about by, you know, effectively through this process of, ingesting it and reworking it in and absorbing it, that this is basically essentially Aiden reclaiming energy that was petrified elsewhere. Can you, can you just talk about this? Yeah. So what the brothers say is their metaphor was they said that things happen to us and sometimes we get damaged and sometimes that's all it is, right? You get hurt, you heal up you're fine or, you know, whatever you walk with a limp. They're kind of fucked up physically. And as I perceive them, though, I know this is projection for me. So take that with what you want. They're, they're pretty rough and tumble dudes, but it doesn't really matter in the context. There's no fever stone formed. What they're saying is that certain traumas happen and these can be physical. They can be psycho, you know, psychic or psycho-emotional, however you want to view it. And it's like a piece of 
material is stuck inside the body that festers and to protect the body. So we're talking some kind of soul complex idea of the body as well as the physical body, perhaps the body encapsulates the stone with very hard material. So it's, it becomes permanentized. So instead of the trauma either being evident, right? Where like, if you have a splinter that's actively, you know, festering, you know, it's there with the fever stone. In most cases, we don't know it's there but it's still doing damage. And from talking to them and my own experience with it, what I've come to believe personally happens is that the piece of us that is most threatened or fearful in that traumatic experience is the core of that stone. And we basically wrap up around it this protective layer. So it's not created out of malice. We create it to defend it. And if we can go through this process of finding these things, hunting these stones and kind of doing an alchemical transmutation with them, their core energy, we can reassimilate that energy. And these are critical pieces of us. It's not just that it's a piece that we lost access to and is actively hurting us. It's a piece of our power. So there's a way that this is a very extreme form of the reclaiming right is what I would say. That is instead of going after the generally dispersed power. It's, it's really going after particular pieces of it that were kind of lost to us and hidden away, but in a way that actually is harmful to us through trauma. One of the things that continually blew my mind was how the, all of these practices fed off of one another. They had these positive feedback loops. And when it came to something like the fever stone and what the brothers taught, what really blew my mind was taking that teaching of the brothers and then going back into the corridor and going to specific doors and opening the doors and going back and revisiting yourself in previous events that happened and extracting the fever stone from your different versions of yourself, you know, in specific memories. Can you just share about this kind of yeah, interlacing? You know, well, that's kind of how they, sh they, they showed me is, I have this thing, and I think we talked about it last time, that I get a lot of what I call kind of psychic body work in the other worlds from these guys. And the sisters have done some of this too, where my understanding from the experiential side, because there's really not much discussion of it when these things happen other than they get my consent, is that they are restructuring kind of my energetic body and kind of currents within my animal body so I can do other things or so kind of stuck or fucked up energies uh, can flow freely. And so that's what the brothers did. So the brothers extracted the first fever stone for me and showed it to me. And then they showed me kind of in my head, me doing it to myself. And so that's how that came about. And I realized that I could use the corridor to find those places, those points in time. So instead of simply going in, as we talked about X doing with her father, going in and interacting with her to say, hey, this is okay. The process is one where you're actually going back, interacting with your earlier self and getting consent to do this, what is essentially kind of a form of psychic surgery and remove and transmute these things. It's an interesting thing. The only thing that I would throw out on all of this stuff, just because it's important for people to remember is I don't really see much visually. And it is really important to not get stuck when we're talking about language of seeing these things, because that is not a universal kind of sensory organ in the other worlds. And so for me, I know what is happening, but I see very little. And a lot of people get really turned off or freaked out that they can't do this kind of work because they're not native visualizers. And it doesn't matter. It really, really doesn't matter because if that was required, I wouldn't be doing any of this work. In the corridor section, you discussed, Aiden, that this could be an office building with, you know, a hallway of just kind of plain doors. It could be um, medieval style doors. Heck, it could be, I think you used the example of the corridor is walking a path in an endless forest. And instead of doors, you just have these kind of dark grottos that open up on either side of you in, in an infinite line. Or uh, I think you used also like a gringy subway with like 
really bad yellow lighting and yeah, it's that kind place of like, is sketchy that place is sketchy <laughs> yes. it's potent but it's really sketchy that's one of those ones and, and i have the same response that x does to it i'm like okay we're in for it this is going to be fun not in a bad way it's just like it's one of those that thing is like i think the modern world version of all this stuff it's a little intense even reading it, I was like, okay, yeah, that, that sounds incredibly visceral. And I guess to your point about visualization, when someone decides to drop into a corridor, they don't necessarily have to have like, okay, it is going to be an office building corridor or okay, it is going to be a forest that sometimes when you drop in, at least from the sense that I got when, when you and X were sharing is there is that kind of unknownness. There's that malleability. I never know where I'm going in the corridor in the sense of, I don't know which one I'm going to drop into. I have the intention to do it. I know what I'm going after most of the time. And it, this is, I think we'll talk about this, but one of the things that I really try not to do, and it's hard to write about these kinds of things and not do it to some extent, but I'm really interested in not forcing meaning. And what I mean by that is a huge volume of magical writing traditionally is very intent on things meaning specific things. So a particular color means a particular thing, a particular animal means a particular thing. And that is not my experience at all. And so in my own practice, this means that most of my work is very, very fluid. So uh, if you were to look at the consecration instructions in Weaving Fate, you can rewrite all that stuff. It does not have to be my words. I know that my words work because I've given them to people and people have used them. If I'm feeling uninspired, I will use those, but I really try and let things, as far as the sensory side of it, unfold in my work as much as I try and do that in the black book. Because I find that over time, then I learn that for like me in the subway, the subway is something really potent. It means something. The forest means something, but it doesn't mean it would mean the same thing to anyone else. It's often very, very different. Laying out the technique of the black book, laying out the corridor, laying out the fever stone as the brothers taught it, you then weave all of these together with a section that explores near the end of the book about liberation, language, and death. This was incredibly powerful, especially after having gone through some of the initial forays into the corridor and making entries in, in my own black book. Uh, on page 147, you say that, quote, for me, kind of bringing all this together, you say, for me, the magical arts are first arts of liberation. They allow us to create or become our own causes and conditions. Can you elaborate on that in terms of the magical arts being first arts of liberation? My take on this is this. This is not specifically the Buddhist concept of liberation from suffering at the base. This is a more immediately tangible. It's about being free, right? It's about being not chained. It's about being liberated in that sense. Like we liberate a prisoner. We liberate a city that is under siege, right? This is the concept there. And it's about that as long as we're boxed in, and operating in these kind of layers of contagion, and these layers of programming, and these layers of conditioning, unless all of that stuff is the thing you want, and for some people, this is, they want that thing. The critical first use of magic is to become more free, to open up more possibilities for you to think, be able to think about, to consider, to act on, and to decide then because you are a freer being, what matters to you? And so that's what I mean by that. It's if we can do that work, if we can let ourselves out of the cages or out of the zoo, as I talk about in the book at one point, if we can free ourselves from those kind of major constraints that really, I think of it kind of like squishing an image down flatter and flatter till it's just a black line, right? That's what life could be. But if we can liberate ourselves and expand that so we can see the whole image, then we can decide where we want to go. And we can become, and that's the, it ties in back into that concept of the wheel of law, which is tied into 
Buddhist ideas of um, dependent origination. Everything comes because of what came before. Magic then is how do we become the causes and conditions for what we wish to see, what we wish to experience. This is why I say that's kind of heretical because we're a, a, a kind of aggressively going after the CDs, right? Which is not the goal of the monk, but it is the goal of the sorcerer. You've got to at least be working towards it. I don't know that anybody ever gets there, but the step is going, okay, I'm aware I am not seeing clearly. I'm aware that I may not be perceiving clearly. I'm aware that I may be being fed stories that are not true or are not useful because Useful is way more important than true in my mind. And given that, what can I do to begin to break those chains, to open the door to the cage and to walk out of the zoo and see what it's like to be a free animal and to then begin experiencing life from that position? Because that's how we'll know where we want to go. Otherwise, we just want out. So the first step is see if you can get out. One of the most sorcerous things that is very traditional and yet so new, the way you do it in the book, is your quotes, your invocations, your calls. And near the end of the book, you have an incredibly powerful piece called the Crossroads Invocation. Can you share with us about the Crossroads Invocation, Aiden, and about the power of this invocation and what it is? Yeah, I'm actually going to read a little bit from the book before it because it's, again, it's, it's said well and it's probably said better than I would right now. And so this a couple paragraphs from the book and then I'll read the invocation. As magic workers, it can be good to do some work on occasion to specifically reinforce the consciousness of our liminality. This is true even and perhaps especially if we work with the gods or spirits of the crossroads regularly. This reinforcement helps us to remember that we are ourselves beings of great power. It is easy to lose sight of this truth and so walk into traps that we need not fall into. Even if we do find ourselves on occasion caught, such work can aid us to not remain in that state. And so the ritual is you go to a place of your choosing. It can be within your home. If this is not something you could do outside where you are, I prefer doing it outside. And preferably go to a place that seems to you liminal. Otherwise, draw a line uh, or cross in the earth, perhaps with cornmeal. Sometimes I've just taken off my belt and laid it on the ground to be the line. And stand so one foot is on either side of that line. The comment on here I will add, because <laughs> it's important, there is a caveat which says, like all works of magic, this one should not be undertaken too lightly. It is an act of claiming an immense degree of responsibility for oneself and one's outcomes. As always, rephrase and redesign the work as needed to suit your own context and abilities. And so this is the, what I call the crossroad or invocation. Powers of the threshold, spirits of doors, gates, and crossroads. I am of your kind. I'm rooted in the present. With my left hand, I touch the past. With my right hand, I touch the future. I stand at the crossroads and I am that. I am the shape shifter. I am the change maker. I am the still point. I am that which walks between the worlds, the shuttle of the loom of fate. I stand at the crossroads and I am that. I see beyond the veils. My vision is unclouded clear-eyed witness. I am the end of delusion. I walk through its ruins. I gaze upon beauty. I stand at the crossroads, and I am that. As I hear that and the words vibrate, it strikes me, Aiden, that weaving fate, it's about techniques on opening the roots of our consciousness, opening the doors to our memories, opening portals effectively to reality in the future via the black book. Was that kind of an intuitive sense when you began writing the book about having this ability or empowering people with the tools to open their own doors, 
literal metaphysical effectively beyond space time was was that kind of an intentional a thing or did that kind of intuitively develop? Because I just, that's just a, such a strong and powerful message of, of the crossroads invocation. It was present in the earliest form of the book, but it got stronger and stronger as I was writing the book. I've said before, my allies are highly involved in this stuff. And as we were coming into the kind of pandemic crisis and what was going on politically around the world and kind of the rise of a lot of stuff that's not good, both on the political realm. And then I think that there's a lot going on technologically that is specifically not good for animals like us. The focus of the book really shifted to what do I think is the most potent tool for people to walk into the changes that are coming uh, and that are already here in power and with the tools to become less weighted by the stuff that makes it hard for us to accept that we are very powerful in a world that tends to tell us absolutely the opposite over and over and over again. And it has the root potential to do much more than just change the individual. If there's a core behind the intention of my allies for this book, that was it. It's like, and it sinks into that earlier concept, that earlier phrasing of it does not have to be this hard. And it is about liberation. It is about power. It is about understanding that you as an individual absolutely have the right. And probably in my mind, if you can get unfucked enough, you will become compelled. I know this is what happened for me to begin exercising that power to become more free, because that is the only way we're going to be able to function going forward. This is on a magical level. This is not a politically specific thing. It is not, not everyone is going to have my kind of somewhat anarchic views of things, but for us to be able to function well as a species, this has to happen. Otherwise, I think we're just kind of doomed to more of the same. And then our fate really is fixed. Uh, it could go a bunch of different ways, but I don't think any of them are very good. In terms of unfixing fate and, and, and kind of navigating those waters, you have a section at the end called the language of desire section. Can you, can you share with the listeners just kind of the, <laughs> kind of the broad strokes about what is the language of desire? So... One of the things that, that hit me at one point, and I don't know when this came about, but was this idea that language or that it was desire was a language and that it was a language we didn't, un most of us didn't understand the words of or the grammar of or any of that, that we misunderstood a very great deal. And this sinks into all of the talks of kind of cultural conditioning and corporatism and its effects on people in that we, all of us that I have ever met, though many are very uncomfortable expressing it, have things that we would like to see happen for us, for other people, for the world. It's not about it being selfish, but there are things that we desire. But I figured this out on, for myself and then played with other people and went, you know, the things that I think I desire aren't the things that I desire. They're like proxies. They're stand-ins. They're the socially acceptable version of the thing that I want. Or they're the closest comparison, or they're the one that is reasonable, or they are the one that is, would be acceptable, and I would still have my friends if I wanted these things. So there's a version of it that is cool. And so I began to then look at that and go, well, if the things that I want or I think I want aren't really my desires, what the fuck am I doing magic for? I'm clearly kind of constantly misfiring, right? And so the language of desire is a very, um, I hope, fun process, and it should be fun. I find it really entertaining, and this is one of those great places for serious play. It's a somewhat ridiculous process of sorting the things that you want in a way to figure out if you really want them so that you can get to the place that you eventually can come out the other end and go, Oh, I know what I want. I know what I want for me. I know what I want for the world. 
this is clear. It's not layered with contagion. It's not layered with social acceptability issues. I know what my targets are. I now know what I should be talking to my allies about or what I should be targeting in the black book. It's a funny one. It's an almost ridiculous process, but it's, it absolutely works. I think that that goes to this question about that section, the language of desire, a, a listener question from Jessica Irene, who's also asking, she says, I appreciated the language of desire section at the end, but felt it should have been more prominently featured within the text. Quite often, we are too subjective or carry too much trauma to genuinely understand, let alone name our desires. And Jessica's asking, can Aiden talk more about his motivation in writing this section, which you've, which you've touched on, but also about how to successfully create a congruent sense of identity while practicing magic. Yeah. So, you know, I'm one of those people. So I went through this process and, and this is the one that really became hilarious for me. And because it was so ridiculous and because I figured out that to get started, I had to go to really stupid desires I want this practice to stop, right? Um, I want to go eat some food that isn't good for me because I'm having an emotional response to this whole process and actually processing those desires. I want shit that I am totally unwilling to say, uh, even out loud to myself. I'm after all the petty desires. I'm after all of the inappropriate desires. I'm after food, drink. I don't care. That is the only way I have found to do this work because it's like anything else. It's like building muscle. It's like you got to work the thing. And so I've had a number of people that have a terrible hard time with it. And I will throw out that I did as well. So anybody who ever suggested that there was something that you shouldn't want was completely full of shit doesn't mean that you could have it. Doesn't mean that you should have had it. Doesn't mean anything like that. But, and this is again, something that really my friend Fabiku hammer, hammers on beautifully about when he says, you get to want what you want, period. It doesn't matter if it is good for you, bad for you, good for other people, bad for other people, you get to want it. What I find is that if we can dig through that layer, we find a place where we go, okay, that was fun, but there were aspects of it I didn't like. Not everybody will have this. There are people that are outright sociopathic and they're going to want what they want and we probably don't want that to happen to anyone we know. But that is not who we're talking about here. You're not trying to understand your desires. You're trying to let them speak through you. You are trying to become comfortable enough or laugh enough or talk shit enough. Often you have to be full of shit for a long time to get through this practice. If you Again, like folks that carry that kind of trauma or are too subjective, it is very difficult to find that serious play point, that kind of earnestness. But, you know, it's that, that horrible and awful, but often true statement that the only way out is through. It's just a piece of work that is as unpleasant for most people as learning to run long distance or learning to play an instrument if you don't have natural talent. Uh, or don't have a good ear, or don't have a good teacher. It's rough, you know? And so I think that it's, uh, it's just one of those things you got to work. The identity thing is huge. And I will be writing more on identity going forward, but weaving fate is, is a big piece of that. That process of liberation work, that process of the desire work, the process of the fever stone should help with the identity thing that you begin to go, okay, I may not know who I am, but I know what I'm not. And I'm just going to discard what I'm not. I'm not going to cave to what I'm not. And sometimes that's the only way that I have been able to get through that. There's shit I don't do. That's all I know about myself. 
I won't fuck other people over to survive. That's all I know about myself. I have done terrible things and I will not allow them to be who I am going forward. Can't do anything about them. Did them. Through all of that, we begin to ask the questions of who would I be? What would my life look like if I was that person? And then we begin to construct the identity from that information. Because the identity is a construct. It's not real. It's a set of concepts and ideas and visualizations and visions um, and stories that have all built up around us. And for people that roll through life really easily, that thing works for them. And for the rest of us, it doesn't. And so we have to go through what is admittedly a pretty arduous process to kind of get to that question of who would I be if I wasn't this messed up and begin doing the work in the book, in the corridor with sigils, however, whatever way you can to make that true. Because it's not a concrete reality. It's not that it's not real, but it's not a concrete reality. It's a subjective reality. And the identity is the thing that controls both your vision and your possibility. It says what you get to see and what you get to do. And so identity work is just massive. You actually end the book. There's, there's other things that you touch on, but you, you really do uh, conclude the book as well. Touching on this concept of death and the biggest misconceptions that people have about death and how some of us might be tempted, especially as we're very vulnerable going through this work with these three tools, to hold a view of death as a failure or how death or the idea of death or oncoming death or the death of someone close to us, that ends up ruling us. So can you, can you share with us about why touch so much on death and then how can we claim death as an ally? So death is, you know, one of the big things if we look at kind of psychology in any of its formats, right? There's, there's kind of like the ability to survive or money as it is in the modern world and, and, and to sex and romance and family and death. Um, there's not a whole lot of other stuff really out there at the baseline. I mean, there's a few other things, but those are the main ones for most people. I talk about it in the book. Death has never been the thing that frightens me. I really don't like suffering. Suffering, I have issues with. I'm not into suffering, but death is okay. I would totally, literally, I, I got no regrets if I went out at any point. There have been times when I had you know, just done something shitty and I would rather it had not been right then, but on a better day. But other than that, <laughs> you know, Bruce Springsteen says in Atlantic City, everything dies, baby. And that's a fact. <laughs> and he goes on to say, and maybe everything that dies one day comes back, right? But that's a maybe. We don't know about that. Um, I have reason to believe that. Death is the primary control tool of if we're just going to talk control as like big capital letters. This is probably like William Burroughs' ideas of control. Death is control. Death of either you or people you care about or things you care about is how all dictators control. This is in our conception of death in the modern world is not unrelated to that at all. It has everything to do with that. I believe that through kind of the rise of, of Christianity and its sense that you went to the bad place or the good place, and for a while you could go to the in-between place, but they canceled that, is absolutely 100% a control thing. It has no basis in anything except control. And so, as I talk about in the book, it's not a question of you're going to die. Everyone's going to die. Everything is going to die. It's constant. It's the nature of life. It's the promise. And so why the fuck, other than this tool of control, have we created the sense of death as a bad thing, as an end rather than a step? Why is it the end rather than the initiation? And so it's, to me, it's very simple in that it's about power, that being comfortable at least with the concept of non-existing in some fashion in the, in the flesh is one of the primary things that you can gain power from. 
and there are a bunch of people out there that are kind of wired like I am that are like, yeah, I don't want to be, you know, like, I don't want to die in pain for years, but that's a different thing. That's suffering. But death itself, when the lights go out, either you go somewhere else or you don't. That's belief, right? I have reasons to believe that I have been here before and I will be here again. This is neither comforting nor upsetting. It's just what I have reason to believe. A lot of this for me came from working with the sisters and the night mother and these other death spirits. And the fact that they've been really clear to me for years now that like part of my function is this, is to work with some of the, those who are dying or, pa- or dead and not fully passed over. To me, doing everything that you can to become comfortable with the reality of a death is one of the crucial steps towards liberation. There's just no way about it. If you are in any way ruled by this abiding fear of something that you know is coming, you're not free uh, in the way that I'm interested in being free. It doesn't mean I want it. It doesn't mean I don't want it. It's just there. It's like the moon, right? Now, the interesting thing is that if we can hit that place where we, as I think I say in the book, we just look at it and go, okay, you are disturbing in some ways to me and I'm going to get to know you and I'll be better with you because I'm not willing to walk in fear every day of my life of something that I know is coming. It's absurd. We can tap into it as a power because it is a massive power. If you look at Odin, if you look at Hecate, if you look at any of the spirits that are arrayed around that, if you look at, right, uh, Santissima Muerte, if you look at Anubis, if you look at these gods of death, these are powers. And they're powers because they're inevitable and they're powers because they're universal. And they are fuel, I think in all cases, to life, but we have to be right there with them. We have to meet them where they are, Uh, which is, yeah, this happens. The body's going to fall apart or it's going to hit a wall or I'm going to blow a vein or an artery and I'm done. And then if there's people around, they're going to burn me or bury me or something. And if there's not, you know, the critters are going to eat me and that's okay because it's completely natural. And I talked about this a lot in six ways, this whole place, every bit of life on this planet is here because of the things that have died before it. It's the nature of this realm. And so there's nothing to be afraid of. It just is. You're not afraid of the moon. I hope, I hope you're not afraid of the moon because I really dig the moon. And that is entirely different than suffering. I understand I don't think anybody has that relationship with suffering. I do my best to be cool with it because that's probably common too, right? There's a weird way that in the modern world, we view death as a failure and we do the most onerous forms of life extension as victorious over death. And I think it's just a crazy form of kind of spirit sickness. To extend your analogy, you know, people are enraptured by a beautiful landscape, you know, twilight, the moon shining, beautiful, you know, midnight landscape. And yet the only reason that that vegetation or any animals you see are there is because that's simply the latest wave of, of an endless ocean of birth and death that has been on that landscape for hundreds of thousands of years. Right. It's crazy. Like if you look at, um, it's one of the reasons that I've, I'm not comfortable with this whole concept that we could save the world by not eating animals. Now, I'll admit I'm a carnivore and I don't do well on non-carnivorous diets. I'm like a keto carnivore, so I'm, I'm not your people if that's your thing. But the way we do it is completely fucked, right? And I'm moving this beyond the suffering of the animal we're supposed to die on the ground and we're supposed to go into the ground and our nutrients are supposed to return to the ground. And then those who follow after us, be they plant or or animals, will be feeding on us and we will feed on them. It's this cycle that you can't get outside of. We have these kind of chemically driven fantasies that we can, 
And I think this is, again, a big part of why we're so lost. It's a fascinating thing. You know, as many people know, I lost my son a few years ago, and then I, my father passed recently. In both of those cases, I was there when my son passed, and I was very close to there. I was nearby when my father passed. If we have this terror about death, those things, those events take a particular shape. And if we don't, they take a very different shape. So I remember, in specific with my dad, going in, and he had passed maybe 20 minutes before I got there. So he was still there, and I went in and saw him. And there was so much relief in the space that he was in because he was suffering so much. And not in that, I don't think he was in pain as he went over right there, but he wasn't doing well. And this mirrored what I've seen in other places. And it is a really interesting thing. And I really, truly believe that this fear of death is a control mechanism that just doesn't serve us, especially as magicians. We are actively involved in choosing the life we want. Some will probably be actively involved in choosing the death we want, but we can certainly choose how we will experience that and only experience it when it happens. I have a friend who, um, she was um, sexually assaulted and she went to a very good physical combatives teacher. And he said to her, she was freaked out about even doing this and I went with her. And so I was just there for their introduction. And he said, the thing that I need you to do if you want to do this is I need you to visualize with me all of the things that you would be willing to do to not experience this. And this doesn't mean you won't experience it again. This is hard to even talk about. Um, but he said, until you can look at it straight on and say, if I find myself in this situation, and I am able, I will kill this person or blind this person or do what I can in that situation. He goes, I can't really teach you anything. And this hit me as being very related to our fear of death and the fact that for those that are not in the healthcare professions, mostly and specifically in hospices and hospitals, we've hidden it from our reality. It's not a day-to-day -day part of our reality in most places anymore. We haven't had that experience where there is death happening in the household frequently, in the tribe frequently, where we see it, we may be involved in it, we may be doing it to other people or animals, and we actually know it. It's not secret. It's not taboo. It's just a piece of reality. And so for me, I know that there was a point where that kind of, I did have some, again, this was more on the suffering end. And what, the only way I could kind of move beyond some of that was to really sit and visualize it and go, okay, I lose my legs. What do I do then? I lose my sight. What do I do then? Because these things happen. These are not unusual things. What is it like for me to experience that? And what parts of it are actually painful or actually scary or actually terrify me? And which pieces are just hard to imagine? And from there, I went back in. And even though I had kind of a, I would say kind of a, a native fear, death fear is not a big thing for me, as I said, it was easy for me to go and go, okay, what happens? I'm old. I do a bad move in the skate park. I get hit by a car. What's the process? What is the process of my death in those situations? What is scary about them? Which piece is scary? Is it not knowing what happens after? Is it the pain of the process? Is it just the lights going out and I don't have a sense of self anymore? And really taking the time to sit in there. It's an incredibly strange thing that we are both so removed from death and just so afraid of it. And I think that they are absolutely related things. I think, I don't think that people a thousand years ago had the same kind of fear of death. 
they may have had a fear of death. That could be, you know, person specific. I don't know, but I think it would have been different because it would have been so present. There's no secret. Now it's kind of a secret. Yeah, I don't know. That was a long ramble, but that's what I got today. I was just thinking that, at least in American culture, being so afraid of death and yet being so far removed from it, it's, it seems the death denial culture extends the other way where, you know, there are anti-aging creams and you can live forever and you can, you know, extend anything and you can, you know, there's, there seems to be a commercialization, unless we're talking specifically about the funeral industry, there seems to be a commercialization of death denialism that just seems to be pretty pervasive too. It's so weird. I mean, it is really an incredibly strange thing. Like, yeah, we get older. We kind of fall apart as we get older or we don't, you know, right. You don't get there. And some people fall apart more. (laughs) A great friend of mine from when I was in my 20s said, as it regards to media, you know, any form of media, he said his thing was, what are they trying to sell you? And usually what they're trying to sell you is that you are not as you are, which is a bad thing, however you are, or they're selling you the idea that you won't die. And I think that that's mostly true. I'm wondering as it relates to death and the journal entries or working with the corridor, just what are, what are some key things that you would like listeners to as they read through your book and begin practicing and using the tools in weaving fate as it relates to death or anything else? What are, what are say two or three things that you, you know, really want people to keep in mind as they work through this process or asked in the inverse, what are two or three things that you think people should pretty much try to avoid or at least not fall into specific mental traps when working through the book? Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is to not worry about perfection. I mean, perfection is absurd as a concept in this kind of work particularly, but overall, it's one of those things that you will, all, every piece of this you will learn by doing and every piece of it is skill-based, which means it takes practice. So, I think I probably did this work for a couple of years before I started to get the hang of it. Had I had something like this book, I think that would have gone much quicker. But it's a learned, developed skill that builds on itself constantly is the main thing to learn. And the other thing is just to be comfortable noting, and this would be my general thing, this is not specific to the book, but note that what your emotional reactions are to things But see if you can use the kind of liminal concept to look at it from a slightly different angle. Like feel it, experience it, don't bottle it up, don't deny it. But also look at it and go, okay, I'm aware that this is to some degree a construct of the body and my chemistry and my fears and my hopes and my dreams. And it's not that it's not real. And I know I've mentioned this in many podcasts. It's just that it's not necessarily always accurate and it's not always necessarily helpful. Now, if you have issues, even feeling your emotions, just work on that (laughs) because that's critical. This is something I work on because I'm a little dispassionate by nature about my own emotional state, but it's going to bring up a lot of stuff and you don't actually have to in the kind of ultimate sense that we usually use, we're saying this, make value judgments about the stuff that rises up. Just note it. It's kind of like a Buddhist meditation approach. Like you're feeling some stuff that's real, but you don't have to do anything with it necessarily. It might come about that you should do something. It might show you something. It might lead you to something. I was kind of amused as I was working on the book and kind of playing in it and started realizing all of the, kind of endless references to some of the, the, again, the Norse mythology things that kicked in for me. Because again, in that section about Odin offering himself to the, to the tree, he says, you know, from a word to a word, I was led to a word from a deed to another deed, which is a brilliant to me explanation. You know, it's a description of the, of the processes in the book, but there's no perfect version. There's no right version. There's no wrong version. It's just work, practice, see what comes, adjust, 
try and be playful with it. We also had, in addition to what you just shared with listeners about Weaving Fate, which is just incredible. And again, listeners, check in the uh, video description where there will be, or in the podcast description, there'll be a link where you can pick up your own copy for Aiden's book, Weaving Fate. Uh, We also got, Aiden, a bunch of listener questions from patrons. And the first one for you comes from Jeff Smith, who is asking, when Aiden mentioned in his previous interview that selling your soul is similar to writing bad checks, is that why so many people have had bad experiences afterwards when those checks bounce? Is there anything you... (laughs) (laughs) I love this one. Um... I'm going to take this one as totally straightforward and serious. And I'm going to say, no, I'm going to say, that's not the issue. And what is the issue is that it's more like one of those invisible fences that people use for dogs, where there's a collar that has like a little mini taser in it that shocks them in the throat if they get to the extent of the radio range, right? And so you can basically keep your dog on your property without having a fence, right? Because they figure out that if they walk you know, beyond the 20 foot perimeter, they get blasted, right? And that that really sucks. And some dogs test it all the time. Usually it makes a little sound or vibrate or something. And as soon as it's off, they're gone, right? But other dogs don't do that. And so I had this neighbor whose dog had one of those and it never got close to the perimeter after about the third time it hit that thing. To the degree that the owner never plugged it in. He didn't put batteries in the dog's collar. I don't even know if the dog still had a shock collar right? And so this dog is fully constrained by the fear of what's happening, right? And it's not even a threat anymore. So my theory here is that it's like your packed it up magician is totally believing that all that he's, that he does is powered by selling his soul, which never actually happened. So he believes he's handed over the keys of his cause and effect to something that has never been driving. And that's the issue. That is a really good analogy, especially with dogs as well. And, and just kind of learning, learning that or assuming there's a reality, which has been a theme of our entire chat that you've been sharing about. Exactly. It's like you believe something is tr- going on and it's not. Yeah. So you've disempowered yourself needlessly. We have a question from uh, someone I know you're very familiar with, uh, the excellent Douglas of the What Magic Is This podcast, who is asking, hi, Aiden, I'm just wondering if there's any actor slash actress, artist, sportscaster, podcast host, cough, cough, performance artist, living or dead, that you'd be able to have read your books for audio. Who would it be and why? Okay. So Doug is fabulous. And he would also do, he would do an awesome job on this. I will say that he has a killer voice. Um, Yes. So far, the best reading of any of my work that I've heard, and this is not much, was from Corey at New World Witchery. And there's a chunk of six ways that he read. I think he read two pieces of it, and it's amazing. So he's way up there. And then there's a professional audiobook narrator named James Foster, who has recently done uh, Matt Oren's Psychic Witch, I believe, and I think multiple books by Devin Hunter, and he is a killer reader. And so he would be awesome. But... And this may be what Doug is getting at rather than trying to get a job. Practically, the Six Ways podcast could possibly be practice for doing this myself. Yes, that could be an interest, absolutely interesting thing to explore. Yeah, so really, that is, that is what I'm planning. The next thing that I have up is to get uh, Six Ways out as an ebook, which I was hoping to have done by now, but this year has been insane, as some of you may have noticed. So I'm a little delayed, but that is the next thing up. I've got two books in the work, but really, literally, um, I am using the podcast, which I should have another episode up shortly, literally as practice to kind of get used to it as a process. And I absolutely think maybe 2022, I'll try and get both books out as audiobooks. Jeff Smith, too, has two kind of related questions. I'll, I'll, I'll ask them both at the same time. Uh, Jeff is asking, what version of the I Ching does Aiden recommend? And then the second question is kind of related. Jeff says, going over the body of work in his interview that he did last year in November, as well as mentioning the microcosmic orbit. 
Jeff's asking, is Aiden familiar with the work of Dr. Yang Zhuang Ming? He speaks of a greater field that we live in. Okay, so I'm totally old school on the I Ching. I'm, I'm a yellow book guy. Wilhelm Baines, a little hardback all the way. The only other one that I've actually enjoyed reading with is Jack M. Balkin's Laws of Change. They're kind of similar, uh, but I do prefer the Baines over Balkin. There's something about it. It may just be that that's what I was exposed to early on, and I kind of love the, the formality of the language there. I was not initially entirely sure about the Dr. Yang Jing Ming thing, but yes, I am familiar with him. I realized I have not read any of his work, but I have played with some of his Qigong stuff. I think I had a VHS tape of his that was my initial intro into Qigong. I had to go and look, and I do have him buried deep in the body of my Amazon shopping cart for, uh, to revisit to get back into Qigong. Nice. Oh, nice. and also, totally weird, just we'll throw it out there because it's just a weird coincidence. His son was at that martial arts thing that I went to teaching uh, that Rory Miller and Mark McKinn were at. So oh, I no way. Actually, I had lunch with his son, who was a very nice guy. And he was very good when he was trying to teach us these crazy ways of walking to do Kung Fu. And I just like, dude, I am going to die if I try this. I'm going to sit over here. And he was like, totally. I can tell you don't know what you're doing. I, like, I do not. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I'll just be in everybody's way. You go help the people that actually know how to do this stuff a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that uh, feeling of helplessness is a feeling I also share with you when I first cracked open a book of Dr. Yang Zhuang Ming's as well. Uh, so yes. this is also uh, another question from Jeff, and it kind of touches on when you first stopped on the podcast Aiden last year about jewelry crafting. And so Jeff is asking in the making of his jewelry, how does Aiden go about preparing himself, sanctifying his tools and then sanctifying and charging the talisman is Aiden hardcore about using traditional tools or can the aspiring craftsman use a small rotary tool with different heads? Essentially Jeff's asking, what is the list of tools that the aspiring jeweler should acquire? I'll give you a list, and Jeff, you're very welcome to write me at Aiden at AidenWalker.com if you have questions on any of this stuff or would like a more complete list, and I'm happy to put that together. I think you get farther, faster with better gear is the first thing I'm going to say, but you don't need much. And I'm only really talking about jewelry fabrication where you're cutting sheet. So you want a really good bench pin. I know a lot of great jewelers that don't use one, but I do. I really like the GRS bench pins. I think that being able to have two that are one at each angle is much more fun, but I was also a production jeweler, so I kind of needed speed. So two is probably excessive for somebody starting, but I really like that thing and I think it helped my work. I like the Swiss adjustable saw frames that are made from square stock, not the totally flexible ones made from round stock and not the old school German ones because they aren't made as well as they used to be, but the square stock ones. Having a saw frame that doesn't flex much is way easier for me to use. On that note, the best saw blades I've ever used are Hercules followed by Antelope, and those will help a lot. You can do a lot of the finishing work with a Fordham type tool. I actually would spring for the Fordham. And if you do a lot of Fordham work, get a Lucas Lowboy foot controller for it. It's awesome. It makes the machine a very different machine. I and mean, you can use that thing for shaping, grinding, etching backgrounds, polishing. It's all I used for that stuff for the, other than sandpaper and polishing pads for a couple of years. I would go with a nice barrette file, just kind of a medium coarseness, just the standard. I can't remember. I think that's a four. I always had to look that shit up. And a lot of good sandpaper. The 3M polishing cloths are the best abrasives I know of. You can get a small drill press for about 75 bucks and that makes it way more efficient to drill holes and stuff for doing piercing work. And you break a lot less saw blades. So that one's way up there. And I'm just a straight acetylene torch guy. I don't like oxyacetylene torches and I don't like the tiny torch, which is what most people love. Um, if I was doing a lot of stonework, I would probably want one of those for doing bezel work, but I don't like them. I like acetylene. I like the Smith, silversmith torch with all, basically all of the small tips. That's pretty much it. Like you need a couple of nail sets. I just make them from hardware store stuff that I 
grind down to get them super fine. Your crock pot and some citric acid for the pickle. And then if uh, you are doing a lot of work getting a gem oro, which makes the best, I think they're like 50, 60 bucks. Ultrasonic cleanser makes the whole process way easier. But again, if you want more information, just write me and I'll, like, I'm happy to run this over the stuff with you. I hope you, Jeff, and, and the other listeners out there who are thinking of taking this on, you just got a list from a master. So uh, definitely, ho- hopefully that will uh, most definitely set you on your journeys. Aiden, we have a question from Jessica Irene, who is asking, Aiden has referred to his allied spirits a few times in previous podcasts and in this book. Does he find that there is a practical utility or necessity in differentiating the various forms of ancestor or lineage spirits? I don't do much work with anybody close in. I think I've said before, my grandmothers were nice, but we also have some serious abusers in the family. And I know there are theoretically processes for clarifying that stuff, but I don't really understand why I would give them the time. I do work very extensively with what I call deep line ancestors. Of them, only one shows as differentiated. I don't really hunt it. It's not something I do a lot of work with. There will be in the next book, some of the ways that I do work with the ancestors, with the deep line ancestors, but it's not really my focus. Um, And so I don't have much theory about it that I could share. This is something, Aiden, that you've touched on in the last podcast chat that we did, but we have a couple questions more from Jeff Smith, who's asking, what does Aiden do to get in the correct headspace when crafting? Does the planetary hour matter or moon phase? So I was lucky that for from 2012 to 2015, I was in a bathroom in the main house that I converted into a shop. And so I didn't have the kind of freedom I got later. My wife is very, very sensitive to both magical energies and then to scents. And I'm kind of an incense whore in the shop. So once I got out of there, first into a big garage and then into this little tiny room that I'm in the shop, I had total leeway to do whatever. So I basically turned it into a working space. That's what it was. And I also made jewelry in it. So it would be literally, if you had a temple room, though I don't think that way, if you had a temple room and you built the jewelry shop into the temple room, you would be on the same page as me. That said, I work really loose. I'm all about current and connection to my allies. So I did not do a lot of the things other people would think. I did consecrate all of the tools as they came into the shop very extensively, very similarly actually to the things that are discussed in Weaving Fate. You know, lots of crossroads work with some of them, lots of talking to them as I talk about in in six ways talking to your saw about what it is and what its nature is and how you wish to call upon it. But because it was an active working space, I really never had to do that again because I was doing constant work. So everything got fixed up on the way in. I don't really do planetary magic. Moon phase matters for some things. If I do, for some reason, do anything dealing with planets, it was all about whether it was above the horizon when I worked with it. So I didn't really do planetary hours. Yeah. So I would come in, I would make my offerings. I would roll in with my coffee or whatever. When I I still drank coffee back then, though it's been six months or something since I've done that. I would make offerings and I would offer water and coffee and incense and candles. And I would explain what I was doing that day in the shop. And then I would crank up the motorhead and just get to it. And that was pretty much it. Uh, And then my own stuff I would consecrate on after that. Again, if you look at six ways and weaving fate, that will give you more than enough information to figure out how I do that. Well, Aiden, and we also have a question from Jeff Smith, who is asking, does Aiden or someone he suggests have a planetary correspondence for metals and different materials in the book? Or is this something that has not been put together yet by a craftsman? I prefer his opinion as he's the one doing the work. And I know, Aiden, that you mentioned you know, you rarely do planetary work in terms of planetary timing, but 
does this also go on to the metals? I mean, some people are saying, you know, for solar, it should be gold and the moon is silver and Jupiter is tin and, you know, Saturn is, is lead and, and stuff like that. I go just with the super basics because I am never going to work with a met- metal I don't like. And the only metals I liked working with were silver, copper, and gold. Yeah, I just never really went there. There's probably good stuff out there. If I was going to ask that question to somebody, I would ask it to uh, Marcus McCoy at Troll Cunning Forge because he's got a really good head on his shoulders. He's a blacksmith and a perfumer, but he's got a very good head on his stuff about kind of uh, what is what and why. Uh, he is where I would go if I was going to ask that question and he might have some references for you. Awesome. Yeah. He's got incredible work as well, for sure. He does fabulous work. So hopefully Jeff, that can definitely help. We do have a few, a quick after show for, for patrons, but Aiden, the last question is, and this is as if you weren't busy enough, because you just, I don't know, finished a book and you have so much other stuff you're working on, but can you give us some hints on some other things you're working on, other projects, opportunities? You've, you've hinted in the conversation at, you know, including things in the future for future writings. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about or anything else on the horizon that, that you want listeners to know right now? The main things that I've got coming up that are actually kind of time, anything kind of new, recent is the Six Ways podcast is up, episode one. I'm headed towards uh, the next ones as I can. It's just been a little bit of a crazy time. I have my show notes. I have my notes for the next probably six or seven of those. And I'd like to start getting them out at least once a month, maybe more than that. And then, as I said, I'll get the Six Ways ebook out. And then the next book comes. And I'm not sure which of the ones that I have lined up will actually uh, be the one that clicks yet. I have one that is kind of... Uh, intended to be kind of oddities that are a few things that are a little more essay-like, a lot of practices that didn't fit in the other books, and some of the things that will come out of the material that I used for the Building the Bones course that I taught, because I won't do that one again, but it had some things in there that I want to use. So yeah, there's two or three books in, in process, but then, but really for timing wise, it'll be the ebook for Six Ways and the podcast for the next while. Of course, uh, we'll make sure to link below, but uh, Aiden, people can find you, of course, uh, picking up a copy of Weaving Fate in Six Ways. We'll make sure to link to those and uh, also check out AidenWachter.com uh, as well for your blog and a uh, link to the Six Ways podcast. Um, is, is, is there any place else that you'd like to uh, let people know about? I'm kind of backing away from social media, media overall. But uh, the Six Ways Facebook group is still very active and I do keep an eye on it, but I have somebody who's moderating that um, and the folks in there are doing very well, primarily without me. And uh, yeah, I'm a little bit more active on Twitter than anything else right now. My preference if people are looking to contact me is just to go ahead and email me using the contact form on the website because that address will probably change before too long. The website's kind of it. I have a newsletter that I don't use very much unless I actually have something to announce. So like when this comes out, I'll send out a newsletter letting people know. So it's less frequent than most people would actually like from what I, the feedback that I get. (laughs) I haven't been doing a lot that I want to share. So I don't see a reason to just fill up the space. Author, talismanic jeweler and dirt sorcerer, Mr. Aiden Wachter. Aiden, like, uh, thank you so, so much just for taking the time again and, and really delving deep into weaving fate. It's just awesome. Thank you for having me. I mean, I super appreciate it again. It's always a pleasure. I get great feedback and good questions. And, and actually, um, you know, the thing that I love about the podcast format is that it is actually a conversation and, and your folks have, and you have great questions you know, as with many of these things, as often they'll end up in other things, they'll end up in the podcast or things that we start here will end up in books, things like that. So it's an important thing to me. It allows me to uh, hopefully kind of support people who are interested in playing in the work. I try to keep the books concise because I think most magic books are not that in a good way and uh, kind of focused on the most usable material but it really does help to have a, a space to converse and expand on some of the ideas behind it. I know not everybody wants that, but I like being able to do that for the folks that are willing to hear me kind of go off on my various tangents. I know that they're not everybody's cup of tea, but uh, I do get a lot of important feedback from it. I certainly hope the listeners benefit from it and definitely enjoy 
weaving fate. It is it is the book that we need right now. That is what the peeps said, and it made sense to me when I was writing it, and nothing has changed that. <laughs> That's the. I'm glad that it's out there. It's hard to write a book because you don't know if you've got it or how useful it will be. But this one, I could tell. Like I didn't. You never know whether it'll, whether people will like it. But I knew that it was useful, and that's all that I can kind of shoot for. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Fair warning, Aiden's book, Weaving Fate, it is powerful, it is direct, and for me, it definitely helps to do the necessary work on the roots of our consciousness. I mean, sometimes it can be painful to explore tough memories in the past or to release the tension and trauma of those memories and reclaim the raw power therein. But this is needed work. I mean, after all, how can the fruits of our magic, like a new job, a new lover, material security, restored relationships, whatever it is, be healthy if the roots, like our very being, how we deal with reality, are not strong? One of the things in Solomonic magic that we talk about all the time, and I know that patrons have asked about this as well, is we all think about materia magica, the wand, the crystal ball, the sword, the pentacle, but we forget, and this is explicitly stated in the grimoires that you, the magician, the operator, you are one of the most important pieces of Materia Magica, and you have to be consecrated and strong as well. And Aiden's book really gives us the tools to do that. I am so fortunate for Aiden's time. And in addition, your wonderful Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions were, as usual, fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Also, uncommon patrons can hear Aiden talking and sharing a story about the Enochian scabies and other issues on Patreon as well, so you can check that out too. You can also always subscribe to Glitch Bottle on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. I hear tell that if you leave a multi-star review on Apple Podcasts, it just might realign the stars. As always, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light.